Okay, welcome to the January 28th uh, commission meeting. Uh, as customary, let's say the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our newest member, Mr. Ken Roberts from Kemmerer, uh, representing District 3, and we'll be filling out that term. So welcome aboard. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chair, we'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. I so move. Minutes be accepted as presented. Second. Okay, it's moved by Commissioner Brokaw, seconded by Commissioner Rial to accept Approve the minutes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All righty. Director Nesbitt. Oh, one more thing. Uh, a little housekeeping here. Uh, if you do not send an advanced comment sheet prior to the start of the meeting, but would still like to comment on an agenda item, please do one of the following. If you're on Zoom via your computer, you can send a chat to the host with your name, phone number, and the agenda item you wish to comment on. If you are listening on the phone, you can send an email to wgfvideo at yo.gov. Make sure to include your name, phone number you're calling from, and the agenda item you would wish to comment on. Thank you. All right. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the commission. Um, first of all, Happy New Year. Um, this is our first commi uh, commission meeting of 2021, first of six formal meetings. Um, do you want to welcome Commissioner Roberts? We're we're certainly glad to have you here today and uh, look forward to getting to know you better and, and look forward to your work here on this commission. Um, I also have another um, introduction. So we have uh, the commission and I talked about this, I guess, about a year ago. And we talked about a, a person who could help out with some of the high priority projects and some policy and planning in the director's office. And so our new policy and planning chief, Todd Larson, is here today comes to us from the great state of Alaska, where he was a, a city manager um, for the last several years. Before that, actually, he hailed from Wyoming and grew up in Wyoming. Um, he uh, grew up in the Cody area and was a teacher and then a full-time National Guardsman for many years, retired from that, worked as a uh, the jail administrator in uh, Park County, and then uh, went to Alaska and served there in a couple positions as city manager. So. We're glad to have Todd here on board. He's been drinking from the fire hose the last several days here, uh, but we're getting him up to speed on, on all the things we've got going. I look forward to Todd's service. Um, also here today, we have our new Attorney General Rep, Jenny Staben, and I think she's right here behind me. I'm certainly glad to have Jenny as part of the team now. She replaces David DeWald. Many of you have uh, had lots of opportunities to engage with David, and, and we're glad to have um, Jenny here today. And, and you'll be hearing lots more from, from Jenny as she provides this commission in our department legal advice. Um, did want to give the commission a very brief COVID update with regards to the status of the department. Essentially, there's no change. We are in the same um, status or posture that we were here back in, in November. We are maximizing telework and we are, um, we still have several folks obviously that are working in offices around the state um, we have kept all of our doors open, um, you know, now going back to uh, since the summer anyway, we've had all of our offices open and are continuing to serve the public both out of our offices and through our, our field employees um, out across the state. You know, we're certainly keeping an eye on the number of cases and um, health guidelines and directives from the governor as we look towards a time when we might start to move back towards um, a, a different posture and uh, a less protective posture. So I'll, I'll make sure the commission knows as, if we make any changes in that posture before the next commission meeting. Um, I did want to start by recognizing the um, our communications section, communications branch for some incredible work they did over the last year. They um, Every year there's an opportunity for the Wyoming Press Association to evaluate and review different types of um, different pieces of work from around the state, written form, video, um, photos, news stories, editorials, all those kind of uh, 
um, different forms of media across the state and our communications section um, was responsible for over 20 awards from the Wyoming Press Association this year, including several first place um, awards. So that was that was uh, really good news and, and reflects good upon the work that all those folks do to get the message of this commission and our department out to the public. Um, very quick legislative update. We right now are expecting that there is a, they're, they're in session now virtually, and it's a short, uh, I think it's an eight day period now, and it will be followed up by some more virtual committee meetings with the standing committees between now and March 1st. And then March 1st, they will conduct a approximately um, 20 to 30 day session that will end no later than April 2nd. Um, whether that session will be in person or virtual is still to be determined. Um, from what we've seen to this point, the only bills that they have been working and processing through their through um, both sides of the legislature are um, bills related to the most pressing issues in the state. So the budget, if you control funding, um, and, and those kind of things, I think maybe some COVID relief. And then also any bills that were worked during the interim um, that went through committees and were passed by interim uh, interim committees. We've had a couple of those, and um, but but that has not been a significant workload at this time. There was a bill that was considered by the Travel Recreation and Wildlife Committee on the House side here recently, a, a bill that would have um, provided legislative direction on um, allowing rendering wildlife rendering. That bill failed to pass out of the House. The what we do expect during the March session, though, is a change to where individual members will be able to bring bills that they're interested in. It will expand, um, at, at least what we know today. It will expand beyond committee bills, and it will be more like a regular session in March. We will um, continue to keep the legislative committee up to speed on on the bills that we're working. Uh, the fiscal notes that we're preparing, as well as any um, bills that get filed that we know we're going to testify on. Quick update on the Wildlife Task Force. The selection process was conducted. We had over 70 applications to serve on that board. Um, President Duby, um, the governor, and um, leadership from the legislature and from both the Senate and the House, we all met and um, concurred on a list, a final list of 18 members for that task force. That's different than what we discussed in November. We added some members. Um, if you recall, there was some requests to add sportsman members as well as some others. And we we looked at those requests and, and I think put together a heck of a good list of folks that um, uh, represent a variety of different constituents and interests that have a variety of experience, come from a lot of different backgrounds. And so I'm excited for the task force's work once once we're able to get started. We did decide, again, that same group discussed um, delaying the, the start of in-person meetings for that group until after the legislative session. Um, at that time, we didn't really know exactly what the session would look like. Now we do, um, or at least we expect that it will likely be over um, no later than April 2nd. And so the work with the task force of, of in-person meetings will occur sometime after that when health conditions allow. We really felt like in-person meeting was, was, was a good way to go for the types of issues that will be dealt with by the by the group. Um, you know, we're looking at the June, July timeframe is what we're hopeful for. And we're hoping that the, the, the environment and um, the health requirements will be at such a place that we can do that work this summer. The topics that will be um, studied by this committee ultimately will be approved and um, will come from the committee. Um, we intend to provide all of the, every member the opportunity to bring forward things that they wanna talk about. The department has met um, with some um, external folks as well as um, the president. And we talked about what our recommendations might be for a few topics, but that's just gonna be you know, the department's recommendations. There will certainly be other ideas that will come from members of the task force. And, um, and then also the chairman will be selected once the task force has its initial meeting. Um, they will have the opportunity to pick 
person who's going to run those meetings and, and lead the task force through the process. The, the culmination will be um, probably after about a year's worth of work, a final set of recommendations that will come to the appropriate decision-making body, either the Wyoming Game Fish Commission, the Wyoming Legislature, or the governor. So that's the update on um, the task force. I'll stop there if there's any questions because there were some changes from what we talked about last time. Anybody have any comments before? Okay, thank you. Okay, last thing I wanted to do is I wanted to take some time to recognize the service of Commissioner Schmidt. So, you know, um, this last meeting was Commissioner Schmidt's last meeting and, and um, he's been replaced, you can see, by Commissioner Roberts here today. But I just wanted to say, first of all, thanks to, to Commissioner Schmidt for his service. You know, Mike was a very engaged commissioner. He was very um, engaged in wildlife issues. He, was, he spent a lot of time preparing to have a very thoughtful discussion um, with this body about, about those issues that, that the body was interested in as well as those uh, issues that he was interested in. He was very responsive to his constituents. I heard that across the state for his entire time on the commission. Um, his constituents were very happy with his ability to get back with them and, and to listen to their concerns. He was appointed and was very involved and instrumental in the governor's migration task force. That effort um, culminated with an executive order that we're implementing now across the state dealing with migration corridors, very good piece of work. He was involved in the department CWD working group and the development of the CWD uh, management plan that we're all um, that we all have in place right now and, and are implementing in some places. Um, very instrumental in the wildlife fund. So, for background, you know we we've had struggles with having a foundation that um, that was synchronized with the department and was focusing on raising money and, and effective at raising money that was supportive and, and worked closely with the commission. And um, this, this idea of this new, this new organization um, really came to fruition and a lot of the work that got done to form it and hire an executive director and get it funded and do an initial set of fundraising was really in large part due to Mike's efforts. He did a very, very good job he, uh, of leading that wildlife fund and, and providing um, a lot of his own efforts, his own um, time and energy into that. Um, he spent a lot of time in the field um, with our employees. He loved to go out and put his hands on wildlife and he worked closely with, with our field personnel. And, and it really gave him a great perspective when he came into the meetings and was able to have discussions on important wildlife issues here. So anyway, I just, on behalf of the department, I wanna thank Mike for his service. I wanna thank him for his dedication and, and really um, you know, give, it, give Mike a virtual hand um, the best we can with, a, with no audience here today and in person, but to really give Mike a, a hand and recognition that he deserves for what he did for our state, what he did for our, our wildlife, our department, and our commission. With that, Mr. President, um, I don't have anything else unless um, the commission, oh, one other thing quickly. So we will be issuing a statement. The commission's going to issue a statement regarding um, Commissioner Schmidt's service and their thanks. And, um, and, and their uh, other thoughts on, on this change. So with that, Mr. President, I would ask for any questions from the commission. Any questions from the commissioners? Any comments? Uh, very well said uh, regarding Mike. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. You did a good job. Thank you. Um, number three, we have a little housekeeping. We're actually going to move that down to, uh, it'll be right before the call to the public. We'll be moving it down. So we'll be moving on to number four at this time, the awards. Cynthia? Pardon. Mm -hmm. They're not here yet. How about we move on to number five? Mr. President, members of the commission, and Director Nesbitt, good morning. Uh, 
This next item that we're going to do is have a discussion and hopefully a selection of the bid for construction of the new Cody regional office. Uh, as you know, we received five bids. We had a discussion at the last commission meeting. You have information in front of you. Um, all those bids were reviewed very carefully by the department, uh, state construction management and plan one architects. Uh, all five bids were fairly close, which reflects all the great work from our services division conservation engineering program, um, our regional personnel and plan one architects. I think the scope of the project was very clearly laid out. Uh, and it was nice to see those bids come in so close. Um, as you know, and as we've discussed, uh, pursuant to statute and state construction rules, we're required to select the lowest qualified bid, bid unless it's determined that the company is unable to complete the work as bid. We have uh, extensively reviewed the low bid submitted by BH Inc. And based on all the information we received during the bid process, they are a qualified company with residency status as certified by the Department of Workforce Services. As the commission knows, there was questions regarding the residency that was investigated further by Workforce Services. Uh, we received correspondence from the Department of Workforce Services on January 20th that they completed that investigation and determined um, as they did before, that they meet the residency requirements as uh, spelled out by statute. So we continue to be at that point with BH Inc. I will tell you, um, it's nice to see that BH Inc. included over 82% of Wyoming resident subcontractor subcon participation, uh, well above the 70% minimum state requirement. That's nice to see as far as keeping work in Wyoming. Um, at that, this point, I'll answer any questions that the commission has and uh, open it up for discussion amongst the commission on the bids. Any questions for Deputy Kennedy? Don. Commissioner Ryan. Excuse me, Mr. President. What was the final ruling on, on the workforce the investigation? What, uh, what did they come up with? I mean, um, Mr. President, Commissioner Rael, the correspondence from the Department of Workforce Services was pretty short and simple that, uh, and they looked at this for a good couple of weeks, almost three weeks actually, um, and all the evidence that they have and in interviews that they conducted, they determined that they meet the requirements as outlined in statute, and they continued uh, to hold a Wyoming <coughs> resident certificate. That was their determination. Any other questions? The chair would entertain a motion. Mr. President, I would move that the commission authorize uh, the department to enter into whatever contracts are necessary to have BH Incorporated uh, proceed as quickly as possible with the construction of the Cody Regional Office. For a second? I would I'll so second. second. Go ahead, Galen. Uh, Motion by Commissioner Crank, seconded by Commissioner Bird, uh, to uh, award the contract for the Cody Regional Office to BH Incorporated. Is there any discussion? Any discussion on that? All right. All those in favor? Mr. President. Aye. Excuse me. Aye. Hold on. Hold on a second. Commissioner you know, Lyle. This, this is uh, obviously a, a statute problem, not a not a uh, game and fish problem on 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 selecting this. Uh, the residency status. Uh, Somehow, some way, I'd like to see that changed and at least a due diligence on, on uh, investigating these, these non-resident residency statuses. And uh, a friend of mine went by there last week and it's a dilapidated building. One employee was in the office and uh, um, he, he told this individual that uh, I don't know what I'm doing here. So that being said, this, this is just a front, and I know they've got two projects going now, and, and we're mandated by law to, to award this contract, but uh, I think it's something that uh, uh, I, hope, I hope the uh, legislators are listening, and we can do something to, to uh, avoid this in the future with any state contract. So uh, state money needs to be state spent with the state residents, and that's my that's my personal opinion. After being in business for 35 years, I've watched this. Um, I've, I've watched it manipulated. I've watched it, I've witnessed it. Uh, so 
that that being said, I had to get that off my chest. So noted. Fellow commissioners, and uh, so vote as you will. Thank you, Commissioner Ryle. Is there any more comments? Mr. President, members of the commission, thanks for that direction. And just for as a formality that um, according to state construction rules and fairly new statute, we're required to present your recommendation to state construction management for final approval. We haven't voted at all yet. So, Mr. President, one more comment. I, I, I do not wish to see any more uh, delays on this project. This is a well-deserved project for the Game and Fish and a well-deserved uh, project for the residents of Cody. So that being said, I'll Thank you. Uh, Are you asking for multiple motions here or just one? No, just one. I think that the, the commission's decision and uh, knowing that we're going to present that recommendation to state construction manager. Right, everybody clear on that? Right. We're good. Okay, it still stands. So all those in favor? Do you need to do a call to the public, maybe? I don't know. Right. Is there anybody, Megan, that wants to speak on this matter? I don't have any here. No, sir. All right. Fair enough. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. All right, motion carries. Thank you. We'll keep you posted and we'll move aggressively. All right. Ray? Mr. President, members of the Commission, Director Nesvik. Hey, today we've got a 20-year uh, a service award for a, uh, a lady that is truly a hidden gem in the department. So, and it's uh, our... You know, Miss Cynthia Nybauer, she's our cashier, and uh, the amount of work she does on a daily basis with cash and balancing uh, is is really truly amazing. So I'm going to turn it over to her supervisor, uh, Melissa Rayner, and um, we'll get you more informed about Cynthia. Good morning, President Duby, Director Nesbitt, members of the commission. I'm Melissa Rayner. I'm here today, with my mic right there, to present Cynthia Nybauer with her 20 year service award. Um, Cynthia came to the department in August of 2017. Prior to that, she worked for various um, state agencies across the state doing financial auditing, accounting positions, and a whole gamut of things. She's had a lot of background. She's worked for the Department of Family Services, doing a lot of daycare providing, auditing, um, food stamp benefits. She moved on for about five years working for the Workers' Compensation Division for the Department of Employment, where she was a medical auditor, um, did a lot of refunds and overpayments and dealing with all of the delights that come with workers' compensation. And then she moved on and went to the Public Defender's Office for two years and there she did a lot of, again, financial information, collection of revenue from all of the counties and the district courts. She did, I can't be heard. Um, she did a lot of what we do today, a lot of processing of Wolf's documents, a lot of the accounting. And then she moved on and spent quite a few years, seven years, in fact, for the Department of Workforce Services. There focusing a lot on medical refunds, Wolf's document processing, deposits, handling key cards. So she's had a huge, vast exposure to a lot of financial processing throughout different state agencies and their nuances. Um, prior to coming to us, she spent three years in the fraud and recovery unit for the Department of Family Services. And in talking to Cynthia through those years, um, a lot of work goes into researching and understanding you know, whether or not those were fraudulent claims, working with the federal government and working in their databases to really hone in on a lot of that attention to detail and doing that fraud recovery. So luckily for us, she came to the Game and Fish in August of 2017, and since then has been the cashier for the department. And as Greg mentioned, she has a position that falls very much under the radar, but is super critical. She handles all of the revenue that comes into the department, which roughly is about $130 million every year. That includes all of the money that we bring in for our license draw that then obviously gets refunded. But she plays an integral role in bringing in all of those dollars, 
making sure that they are tracked and deposited correctly. And then once the draws are conducted, spends an extensive time working with licensing to make sure all the money is collected, it balances with the draw reports prior to the draws being conducted. So it's a very focused, um, disciplined role where you spend a lot of time by yourself and doing a lot of data analysis and making sure that everything balances and reconciles. Um, she, and she does a fantastic job. We are super pleased that we have her. She's a very independent worker. She has reached out multiple times. As you can imagine, you guys approve a lot of things through licensing, whether that's at the regulation level, statute level. A lot of that trickles down to Cynthia. When we implemented LSA ACH payments, she had to revamp how we were doing things, change her process. And so she asks the right questions. She works with the right people to make sure that she's doing a very accurate job in any gamut that we give her. Um, some of the few ones that she's also played an integral role, we took over, as many of you know, management of the Governor's Big Game License Coalition last year. That obviously has required some changes internally for us to figure out how to manage that program. The dollars that are received for the sale of those licenses comes to Cynthia and she manages that outside of the game and fish responsibilities, but it's taken on a, as a, on a role as there as well. So with that, and not in short, she was also recognized as the Fiscal Division Employee of the Year in 2018. So just a short time after she started here, um, it was quickly noticed that she was going to be a very valuable participant in the Fiscal Division. We absolutely enjoy her. She has been removed, working remotely almost 100% since and has done an amazing job. She's adapted, she's worked with me closely to handle, obviously we have a lot of cash and checks that still require her to come into the office on a periodic basis, but everything else she has been able to do remotely and she has done a great job. So with that, I just ask that you uh, congratulate Cynthia along with me for her 20 years of service to the state of Wyoming. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Bibby. Good morning, Mr. President, the Commission, Director Nesbick. I just have one land item for you this morning. Uh, this project is located in the Casper region. In fact, it's just southwest of the city of Casper on the other side of Casper Mountain. The ranch is called the Eagle Ridge Ranch. It's owned by the Scott family. They've had this property enrolled in our Access Yes program for 20 years now. Uh, at this point, they've approached the department in the region to discuss the possibility of obtaining a permanent public hunting access easement and or a combination of a conservation easement or public access. So this property consists of approximately 8,850 feeded acres. Of that, a little over 6,000 is already enrolled in a conservation easement with the Nature Conservancy. So as you can see, this property is a fairly decent size, nearly 9,000 acres. Uh, 
would you mind going to the next one for me, please? Thank you. So this map, the the portion of uh, the property that's in green here is the portion that's already encumbered with the conservation or the, the nature conservancy. These other two portions that are in orange and red are uh, possibilities you'd like to explore for potential conservation and permanent public access. So as I stated, this property has been enrolled with the, the Hunter Access Yes program for 20 years for 15 hunters. So that includes antelope, elk, and deer. This is currently in elk area 19, which is just outside of Casper. And at this time, the department's recommendation to the commission is to just move forward with exploring this project, doing some due diligence with the, the, the title research, uh, negotiating with the Scott family, and looking into you know, the possibility of uh, a conservation easement or the combination of uh, permanent public access and you know, the, the whole portion of the property or some combination thereof. And then we bring that recommendation back to the commission at that time. Any questions? Is this the Charles Scott, the longtime legislator? Mr. President, it's a relative. Any comments regarding the department's recommendation? Okay, no. Go ahead. President, I guess there must be access there on the left. Is that highlight? Where's the road access to just up on the west corner? Or? Excuse me, Mr. President, I apologize. There's already, it looks like there's already access to the existing easement. Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Bird, there is access. Um, on a portion, on a road that kind of heads northeast here. There's some public property there. But there is some interlocking public land within the range that is not accessible without access to this, this particular property. Uh, the other important component for this is that the deeded property in and of itself is fairly sizable. And right now the community uses this uh, quite a bit. And these folks were actually uh, landowners of the year for the capital region, if you recall that presentation in September. So this property has become uh, Pretty important for the recreation of the, the community there, so we'd like to explore uh, what a permanent access might look like. What is uh, down there on that the southern part of it there, the little square that's uh, black but that has no color to it? Is that going to be exempt from the, the whole property, or what's the deal with that? Mr. President, that's correct. So this, this little portion of the, the property here they'd like to leave out for a potential future home site. Uh, so is there no access across that? <coughs> Uh, currently, there is, uh, I believe, this included in the. So there'll still be access, but it just won't be part of the easement. That's right. All right. All right. Chair would entertain a motion. Mr. President. Commissioner Frank. John, if I remember this, this is kind of on the west end of Casper Mountain, correct? Mr. President, Mr. Frank, that's correct. Um, this. Uh, this is Cole Mountain Road right here. This is 487 coming up from Mills Middle area. And then this is 220. Okay. What What is the property on the northeast boundary and all through that? Is that all private? Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Judy, uh, let me go back on that. Uh, okay. But all of that through there is state and uh, BLM, right through the middle of it. And quite a chunk. But and Mr. President, Sean, if I'm looking at your map correctly, Bates Creek would be to the bottom of this map on the other side of 220, which goes from Casper to Medicine Bow. Correct. Yeah. 
presentation if I got correct, feel free to send me your side. What's your pleasure? Mr. President, I'm prepared to make a motion. Commissioner Crank. I would move that the department continue to explore possibilities with regard to permanent access easement or conservation easements or whatever they can work out with the Scots. I mean, it, it's a important piece of property that'll give recreationists access to large amounts of BLM and state land. So, I'll second. Okay, it's moved by Commissioner Crank, seconded by Commissioner Ryle. Uh, any further discussion? Is there any comments from the public, Megan? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Thompson. President, do we members of the commission recognize that? <clears throat> Good to see everybody. I haven't been here since a year, but I can't keep showing you so it's kind of odd. Eating at a restaurant has got other things to that. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm here to present uh, the Chapter 3 Black Bear hunting season regulations. <clears throat> and so this is a little bit of an anomaly this year in that, as you know, we normally set these in three years cycle. We set the black bear seasons last January, uh, but we weren't ready for, we weren't anticipating the pandemic to hit when it did. And so we had to work very swiftly to, to foster a way for people to apply for a new bait registration, to register for a new black bear bill that they had, right, without meeting in person. Uh, if you know in the past, People would camp out at our know, game and fish offices. It's kind of a rite of passage. People would do that for days, sometimes sleeping out the front. And obviously, we couldn't do that because of uh, COVID restrictions. So we worked very swiftly to develop the process in order to allow that to happen. And uh, we moved from that first come, first serve basis for these new baits uh, to a lottery system on a regional basis. And again, this is just for new baits. After that went through, uh, again, that was done uh, very swiftly in order to serve our public and, and make sure they had that opportunity to register their candidates. And after that, we wanted to follow up and, and talk to the people, see how we could improve that process. So uh, we convened a, a committee uh, led by Jason Hunter and myself and actually with the office managers to develop a survey to, to go out to those individuals that registered those people. Uh, we have a very good response rate and overall very broad support for this new registration process. And again, appreciation that we move forward to allow people to acquire those new dates. And so it might be kind of hard to see, but we asked a few general overarching questions. How would you rate the overall registration process for the year? Uh, the strong majority were very supportive. Uh, the issues we heard were as expected, it happened too quickly and there was not enough notification to some of these people, which uh, you can only do it in a piece of full process. And we understand that completely, which is why we're going to have a much more full funnel approach this year. Uh, one thing that we did develop was an online map system, which we did not have for Black Bear Base in the past. Uh, this allowed people to access it from their computers and see what's open and what's available. This is very beneficial and, and very appreciated by people. Over 70% people are very appreciative of this. Now, we obviously had a few glitches and things that didn't work because it happened so quickly. We worked very closely with the IT people to fix those glitches moving forward to make that a, a much more beneficial process for Black Bear Hookers. The new Black Bear hate site designation. People were very kind of it. Again, uh, how would you rank the online priority ranking? A general support, there's still a lot of people uh, that would prefer the first come, first serve basis, which is understandable versus the lottery system. Uh, but again, we've, we've tried to make this as fair as possible to all the people. And we've tried to, and the other things we also heard about were the same issues of it happened too fast, there wasn't enough warning. And again, obviously, we'll be making sure that that is the same. It's not a brand new thing that occurred at the last month. 
And so based on all those comments, and, and also we're always talking with people in the field and people that came into the office, we used those comments from that survey and suggestions from blackberry hunters and people that took part to basically make what we did last spring more efficacious for the general hunter and, and indoctrinate those into our current uh, regulations, which is why I'm here tonight. So you'll see in the regs, uh, these, these, are, these are mainly just uh, verbiage changes. Uh, I kind of joke, this is more of a Mike Choma type of discussion than a Dan Tom type of discussion <laughs> because it's about the, the changes in the regulations. Uh, but so we moved section four uh, just to, for more clarity. And this was actually a, a suggestion by a lot of the office managers to deal with this as well. And so the, the main language changes are in section four, which was previously section five. There's some verbiage changes just for consistency with application by clearing data site. But what you'll see is that a person may register up, apply for up to six bait sites. And then all those are put into a random draw process that is open uh, in, in late March. And there'll be a draw process on April 1st where those are assigned to a person. You can't have more than you're available for. So each person is allowed to have two bait sites. Uh, regular hunters allowed to have two bait sites. So you can put in for six if you want. If you, depending on where you rank in the random draw process, you can get two. You can't get more. So it's not giving out more bait sites. Um, you must apply, and then once that draw is done, we are allowing people to register in person starting April 5th. Again, we were just trying to get away from that land rush all at once in, in, in the basis of COVID. We do allow online renewal of baits. This is a fairly new thing that happened several years ago. Uh, and so that process is done by March 1st. And so you'll remember we changed this that if a person didn't re-register a bait site, that becomes open. So there's, that's where that time frame is. If you don't register a site by the 20th, that would become available and the person could look and see if those are available in that 21st and 28th time frame in order to go into that process. Um, and then just some, some, some general housekeeping, you know, the, the person will be furnished a registration document indicating that that site has been approved. Again, we have to have GPS coordinates of a bait placed on the ground in order for that bait to be valid for, for the filtration of the next year. Some minor changes. Uh, we did move some hunt area boundaries last year between 7 and 35. We just had to get rid of one of those because it incorporated or something that's more of a typo. Uh, and again, we deleted a section because it was already addressed in the previous section. And then general minor formatting edit for the sake of clarity. We did hold a public comment process, I guess virtually you could say, because of COVID restrictions, we did not have any in-person meetings, but we, we opened that public comment process with these both changes and regulations from October 19th, December 4th. We only had two comments. Uh, one was just questioning whether we could discuss the use of dog for black bear hunting. And then the other comment was strongly agree with those changes. Had some questions about potentially changing in the future, whether sites could be held for only so many years and then we link questions for the back in the process. And so a member of the public could get a, a highly prized um, site that somebody might have. But that's a bigger discussion. And so based on those comments, uh, we have no proposed changes to what we're bringing to you today and we will ask for you to adopt. Thank you, Dan. Uh, any questions from the commissioners? It's kind of tight lipped this morning. Yeah. If there's no questions, I'd entertain a motion. Mr. President, I motion uh, uh, we accept the department's proposal on, on this uh, uh, section of their day. So. I'll second. Okay, moved by Commissioner Ryle, seconded by Commissioner Byrd to accept the department's recommendations on these changes. Any questions or comments? Anything from the public? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Mr. President, one more thing. Dan, thanks for everything. Okay. It's been a heck of a party. <laughs> Thank you.
Did everybody hear that? <laughs> Got it. Speak into the microphone, please. Am I all right? All right, we're going to skip over number eight as that's time sensitive. So we'll move on to number nine. Angie? Director Nesbitt, commissioners. Um, today I will um, start off number nine, where we're asking for your approval for the department's guidelines on our wind and solar implementation. I'm going to start by just talking about the scale of wind and solar development in the state and what we've seen over the last three years, two or three years, and then turn it over to Amanda, who is the contract protection supervisor, who carries out this process for the department and uses these guidelines daily. So I don't think I need to tell you that Wyoming ranks first in class six and seven winds in the nation, making it a very likely spot for wind development. However, with that said, we rank 17th in the nation for wind projects. The so first one was developed in 1999 at the Foot Creek. Thanks, President at the Foot Creek Rim near Arlington. And since then, we have worked on over 20 different projects in the state. The state currently has approximately 1,800 megawatts of wind online and expected to have over 4,300 addition, 4, additional megawatts in the next coming year. Uh, and really with all these 20 different projects, we've really seen the biggest increase in the projects in the last four years. Um, my feeling is that has a lot to do with um, the federal production tax. If a wind developer started construction between the years of 2016 and 2020, they were eligible for that federal tax credit. However, with that said, we do anticipate a lot of additional wind projects coming on board in the next coming years as well. Now let's touch base on solar development in the state. In 2019, we saw the first constructed solar project um, in Wyoming. And since then, we have worked with proponents on 14 different projects throughout the state. And so when I talk about working with these different project proponents, what does that mean? What is the department's role? And it is within the Industrial Siting Council within Department of Environmental Quality that permits these projects. However, in their rules and regulations, they require the proponent to reach out to the game and fish and consult with us in order to minimize the environmental impacts of the project. They are also um, supposed to describe in their Industrial Siting Council application how they plan to mitigate for any fish and wildlife impacts that they create. In the 2020 legislative session, um, solar was added to that permitting process. And wind projects went from 30 turbines requiring a permit down to 20 turbines needing a permit. So Amanda's gonna walk you through this document um, and talk about the changes that we made in, in it. But before she does that, I'd just like to take a moment to talk about what we've learned in the last few years and where we think we need to really focus our future efforts on. Uh, when it comes to solar and wind development, at the end of the day, we really feel that it's about location, location, location. If sited in the correct place, we can drastically minimize the fish and wildlife impacts up front. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, we, in the last year-ish, we reviewed a project that was on the edge of town. This was a solar project about 1,700 acres that it would be developed on. It was on the edge of town next to an interstate and next to other development. The vegetation that it was being developed on was already um, in, um, introduced vegetation and very little natives left. In my mind, that project was cited extremely well. They minimized the fish and wildlife concerns by choosing a great location. So moving forward, we really hope to work with proponents 
and having those conversations really early and upfront of where they locate in Wyoming. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda to walk you through the new draft document and highlight the changes that were made. Good morning, um, President Dubey, members of the commission, Director Nesvik. Um, thank you for giving me some time on the agenda this morning to walk you through this document. Um, hope you got a chance to flip through it in the commission notebook. It's a little bit of a lengthy document, um, but it has a lot of good content. We've spent the last year uh, putting it together. And as Angie mentioned, uh, we're seeing an increase of project proposals being submitted for our review. Um, and so it would be a really good tool to have um, for us to move forward in implementation after it's finalized and approved by the commission. Um, I'm Amanda Losh, I'm the supervisor of the Habitat Protection Program, and I'll give you a little bit of background on the program here in a minute in case you're not familiar with us. Um, but the three things that I wanted to touch on today are um, to be able to provide you with some background on this document so that you have an understanding of what it's about and why we need it and how we're going to use it. Um, I can answer any questions you might have about it um, or other curiosities about what we're seeing for wind and solar development in the state so far. Um, and then just asking for your consideration for approval of the document so we can move forward with implementing it. Okay, so just a little bit of quick background on the Habitat Protection Program. Um, we, I don't think we get up here very often. So we are a statewide program, and currently we have four staff biologists and an office assistant. We're based here in Cheyenne, except for one of our biologists is based out of the Lander Regional Office. And our primary function for the department is to respond to requests for review um, for development-related projects or project proposals that are submitted to us, and we review those projects for potential impacts to fish and wildlife resources. So the most common types of projects that we review in the state are obviously related to energy development, oil and gas and mining and wind and solar increasingly. And then we do see other things, other uh, human development and disturbance such as subdivision and recreation events. Um, so what does our project review process look like? Um, basically, we'll receive a request for review for um, a project, and it may come from a project proponent, it may come from um, the developer, it might come from a consultant, it might come from the permitting agency. Uh, and we take a, a, a deep dive into that project to evaluate the fish and wildlife resources that could be impacted. Um, and during that review process, we're going to consult the local biologist and any, and any specialist that might um, have information in that area. We use our geospatial layers. We have existing recommendations documents for aquatic and terrestrial resources and some energy development related um, guidance. And then we often also turn to the commission mitigation policy, which the last time it was reviewed and up updated by the commission was in 2016. So after our review of a project is complete, we then communicate back with the project proponent or the permitting agency with recommendations about um, measures or um, measures or steps that they can take to mitigate Im the identified impacts associated with that project that we reviewed. And then uh, additionally, our team, the Habitat Protection Program team is also has a primary responsibility of reviewing these projects for consistency with our two executive orders. Um, Governor Gordon's executive orders for sage grouse and migration corridors. So that provides you a little bit of context about how the projects flow in, how we might come to receive one of those wind or solar projects to review, and then how we handle it. So let me tell you a little bit about how we developed this document. Um, about a year ago, we uh, picked up our wind energy guidelines, which is an existing recommendations document that was approved by this commission in 2010. Um, and we thought it timely to take this document and update it since it had been about a decade. 
Um, and then in the process of doing that, um, decided that it would probably be prudent to include some information on solar energy development as well, since we've been seeing um, projects trickle in uh, for solar in addition to wind. Um, as we were updating the document, we wanted to provide extra focus on communication between the department and the project proponent, and then also expand our general recommendations regarding mitigation and monitoring. So we formed an internal team um, over the past year in 2020, and some of the discussions we had included how to format the document, thinking about who is, who is the audience of this document and how can we best convey the information to them. Um, we talked about what we've learned in the past 10 years since that 2010 wind guidance was last approved by the commission. Um, and not so much what, what have we learned in terms of research as wind relates to um, wildlife, but what have we learned about our process in the last 10 years in working with project proponents and permitting agencies? What part of the process worked really well? What wasn't working? And how can we make an improvement on that in this round? And then, of course, the internal team really provided a lot of support in reviewing drafts. Um, the final step of our development of this document involved some stakeholder outreach. Um, and so we, we wanted to get some input from our external partners who we interface on a regular basis with these types of projects. So we sent a draft out to several folks from the wind and solar in industry itself, um, some NGOs, consultants, agencies, county representatives, and also landowner representatives. Um, we gave them a couple weeks to, to review the draft. They provided us a lot of great feedback, and then we spent the next month after that incorporating their feedback. Um, not on this slide, but real quickly, I think if you were to do a side-by-side -side comparison of the 2010 wind energy guidelines with this, um, well, now 2021 wind and solar guidelines, I think four main, four main or major changes that you'd see between the documents are in the 2020 guidelines, we really made an effort to outline a clear five-step process for project review that focuses on communication between the department and the project proponent and um, also focuses on providing feedback for avoiding and minimizing the impacts associated with that project. Um, you would notice expanded recommendations and best management practices for minimizing those impacts. Uh, more detail, we provided more detail on pre and post construction monitoring recommendations and also um, more detail on how exactly to develop a monitoring plan and uh, putting together a technical advisory committee associated with that monitoring plan and reviewing the data and information that comes back as a result of the monitoring. Okay, so then um, the primary purpose of this document is really to aid in department review of proposed wind and solar energy projects and to provide a consistent process for communication of the recommendations to reduce impacts to fish and wildlife resources. Um, again, we emphasize in the document project siting and planning, as Angie alluded to, uh, monitoring of the impacts, and then post-construction adaptive management to alleviate any significant impacts that are being identified. One bullet that I didn't put on this slide that I should have uh, was the purpose of this document is also to provide a resource to project proponents so that they have a sense of our expectations when they bring us a project to review. They know they have more clarity on exactly what we're going to be looking for. So aside from finalizing this document, um, we have two other efforts underway related to wind and solar energy. Um, we're currently working with uh, wildlife and fish divisions to conduct a comprehensive literature review to capture any new science relative to these two types of energy development that may have cropped up in the last 10 years since we last looked at it with the 2010 wind energy guidelines. Um, and what this literature review will really help us do is it will help us uh, summarize the impacts that are, that are known to date with these two types of energy development It'll help us um, develop any additional recommendations for mitigation, any uh, additional recommendations for monitoring techniques or revised recommendations for monitoring techniques, and also could help the department identify future research priorities associated with 
um, wind and solar. Um, the second effort that we're working with our GIS folks on is developing a mapping tool for project siting. Again, as Angie alluded to, siting is one of the most compo important components of especially solar development. Um, we're really emphasizing it with project proponents and we'd like to develop a tool to assist project developers in exploring our wildlife layers in a way that helps them understand where, where there might be a high conflict area versus a low conflict area to put to site a project like this. Okay. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions about the document um, or, or what we might be seeing in terms of wind and solar through our program. Um, and really looking forward to implementing this document. I think it's gonna bring a lot of consistency with our work with project proponents. And so thank you for your time. Any questions for Amanda? Sure, Mr. President, I do. And Brokaw. Um, from Carbon County, Shirley Basin, we've got lots of wind development. And Megan, something I see is industrial siting will permit, county commissioners will permit, they'll go build a farm right up to the edge of a core area. They'll build their project, then they'll come back with an amendment. We need to build a road right through this core area. Um, and the county not to stall the project, we'll go ahead and issue those requests. For building a transmission line along 487, um, local conservation districts and county commissioners are asking that they put both those big lines right beside each other. Um, but they're getting exemptions for they can't be so close together, I don't know. So you've got a huge power line, 487, and now another big power line. That's gonna, I, I think that'll affect migrating antelope and elk through that area. What I would like to see is the department take a more aggressive stance in working with local governments that are advocating for those wildlife benefits. And I think once we get into those big construction projects, um, I think the companies have learned that in their initial requests for permits, they'll get those, they'll get, they'll just get right up to the edge and get by, and then they'll come back with amendments and they'll get those darn amendments that I think are detrimental. In your plan, do you have a, a process or a strategy to help get more aggressive on those type of situations? Yeah, um, President Duby, Commissioner Broca, I think that's a really good observation that you make and, I, and it's right on target. Um, one thing that we are doing is we uh, are actively outreaching to the counties more and in different capacities. Um, including the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. Uh, and I think one successful thing that is going on right now is the various counties, not all but some, have started to incorporate into their um, county rules and regulations uh, sideboards associated with wind and solar energy development. And for, for wildlife purposes, a lot of times that looks like um, a directive to the project proponent from the county to consult with the game and fish <coughs> department. And so that is a benefit in terms of sending the project proponent in our direction so that we can ask them comprehensive questions about the various pieces of their development and or phases to understand the big picture and provide appropriate recommendations regarding siting. So I think that's a really positive step. Um, and in, in terms of action on our part, uh, that that is what we're working on is increased coordination and communication with the counties to let them know that they can direct project proponents to us and we're happy to work with them on wildlife related matters. Good, Good. I appreciate that. Any other questions? Amanda on the on solar, are they coming to us or are we working with them prior to them purchasing the property or are they trying to fit it in afterwards? Uh, because that's kind of a that's a different deal, I think, than the solar or than the wind energy. Um, so how does that process work? Because I'm assuming those are probably on private land almost exclusively, as opposed to BLM or state. So how, where are we at in that process? Where do we enter into it? Pre-buy, post-buy? How does that work? Um, President Duby, that's a really good question, and the answer is yes to both. Um, <laughs> It depends a little bit on um, the company that's proposing the project. Um, and for those companies who are um, out in front of things or heads up and have worked with us before, uh, they do tend to come to us in advance of potentially leasing a property to place one of those projects. 
to get our input, they may bring us um, uh, a package of a couple different options to look at, and they want our 30,000 foot view of um, which ones of these are gonna have a lot of restrictions associated with them and which ones are gonna be easier to develop, um, which that mapping tool I was discussing would be um, really helpful in that manner as well. So we have those project proponents that we work with, um, and then they may go forward and if they had a handful of, let's say five sites, they may go forward and actually try to develop two of them, which were lower conflict based on our feedback. But as you mentioned, we also do get project proponents that come forth um, who have, you know, the those are idling on the site already, and they're coming to us for our recommendations. Um, they've already leased the property, they're ready to go and construct. And so, Working, working with those situations is a little bit more tricky in terms of getting effective things imp implemented, but we do have the monitoring component so that we can evaluate the impacts and then continue to work with that project proponent um, as the project is constructed and afterwards and work towards alleviating those, those impacts post-construction where needed. Are you finding that the properties that are already leased or purchased prior to uh, our involvement is it because of a lack of knowledge? They don't know that we are part of the process or trying to be part of the process, or are they trying to avoid the process? A little of both, that yes to both on that one too? <laughs> <laughs> um, President Doobie, it could be a little of both, but I think in our experience so far, it's generally um, because the project proponent has to go several different places for different types of permits. They might need a permit from the Industrial Siting Council. They might need a permit from the water quality division of DEQ, they might need a county permit. Um, and then, oh, by the way, um, you need to consult with Game and Fish as well. I think that there's just a lot of boxes that they need to check along the way. Um, and so I don't know if it's, in, I don't, I guess I wouldn't say that it's intentional, but more that um, it's a, a little bit of a disjointed process. And because this type of development is so new, it just doesn't, it just doesn't run like a well-oiled machine yet. Appreciate it. Any other comments? All right, well, the chair would entertain a motion. Mr. President, I would uh, move that we accept the department's guidelines for wind and solar development. For a second. Oh, yeah, oh, that's right, my bad. All right, uh, before we vote, well, we're just making a motion at this point. So, so is there a second to that motion? I'd second the motion, Mr. Price. Right, moved by Commissioner Bird, second by Commissioner Brokaw to accept the department's recommendations on wind and solar. Now we'll open up for public comment. So we have Jennifer Lamb. Okay. Good morning, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioners. Director Nesvik, my name is Jennifer Lamb and I work for the Nature Conservancy. I'm based here in Lander. Happy to be able to join you today, at least virtually, to participate in this conversation. Um, I really appreciate being able to hear some of your questions and your consideration of this guidance. Um, we work quite closely with the department on a variety of issues in different capacities across the state. Um, we really appreciate the department's work on developing this guidance. It's it is dense, it's science-based, and it's really important. I couldn't agree more with both uh, Angie and Amanda about the importance of location in this process of citing renewable energy projects. Um, there might be a lot coming our way, and I think the harder we can work to get out in front of it and drive it the way we feel it needs to be driven, the better we're going to be in the long run. Um, I do believe that the department has crafted thoughtful science-based recommendations um, I think they strike the balance between the opportunity for new economic development, which I believe is very important in Wyoming right now, especially, um, but they balance it with also the need to safeguard, obviously, the, the wildlife and the landscapes that we all care so much about. So we're very happy with that. We, we reviewed the draft. Um, we've made some recommendations about how to beef up science in the, do in the document, and, and that's been done, and we will continue to support that because we know the science is developing on a daily basis. Um, we also strongly support the department's work to develop this map tool. Um, again, I, I concur completely with 
the importance of having developers come early and often to the department to, to consult before projects hit the ground. That's the only opportunity really we have, the best opportunity, right, to, to get the outcome we want in terms of siting in low impact ways. So I believe that a tool like this can potentially put information in the hands of developers uh, more easily and more efficiently and just make this process more accessible. And I think that's one of the challenges we should continue to wrestle with going forward, which is how do you, how do you get those conversations happening as early as they can happen? Um, so again, I just really appreciate the work that's been done to date. I, I appreciate you putting this on your agenda and giving it consideration. Uh, encourage your support for it and uh, offer up the Nature Conservancy support moving forward as you work to implement this guidance. Thank you so much for the time this morning. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jennifer. Any questions for Jennifer? Thank you very much. Appreciate your comment. Any more discussion from the commission? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, we will have a break till 11 o'clock. Okay, we'll move on to Angie. Yes. Yeah. President Duby, Director Nesbitt, Commissioners. I'm going to start off the commission item number 10 as an informational presentation. I'm gonna give you a brief update of the governor's executive order on migration corridors, the Platte Valley Local Working Group, and then turn it over to Dr. Ember Hall, and she's going to present on the Platte Valley Biological Risk and Opportunity Assessment. So just about a year ago, in February of 2020, Governor Gordon signed the Migration Corridor Executive Order. And just to provide a brief summary of what this executive order stood for, recognizes that migration corridors are essential to maintain a viable mule deer and antelope populations. It recognizes the three designated corridors, the Platte Valley, the Bags, and the Sublet, mule deer corridors establishes a process for those future designation of additional corridors, and it defines designated corridors as those being at risk. Um, it is this formal act of designation, rather than just identifying corridor, that warrants limitation of human use to conserve the migration corridor. These possible limitations are activities requiring a state permit um, and should be permitted in a manner that maintains the continued functionality of the designated corridor. These limitations are applied on projects only on public lands that require a state permit process. And the EO also recognizes valid and existing rights of projects. It talks about counties and how they may amend their county plans to be consistent with this executive order. And it instructs the Game and Fish to continue to work with Wyoming Department of Transportation on wildlife crossing projects. So to date in this last year, the department has done wildlife reviews on about 17 projects in these three designated corridors. That project review process that Amanda previously outlined, um, that's what I'm talking about with these 17 projects. It's interesting, most of those projects fell into that category of uh, valid and existing rights. So they were projects already on the landscape. An example of one of those might be uh, uh, YDOT road project where they were coming in and just doing maintenance on that road. It was already a valid and existing right. A few of the projects were new, and then a few of the projects were conservation projects, even some of ours where we were improving habitat. To date, there has not been a single application for permit to drill on either Bureau of Land Management land or Office of State Lands investment land in any of these three designated corridors since the executive order was signed and since the three corridors were designated in 2017 and 2018. 
And then as part of the executive order, the governor's office will work closely with county commissioners to convene an area working group for each corridor in order to review the effectiveness of the corridor designation. That group then is charged with making any recommendation to the governor's office. The governor's office has chosen the Platte Valley Working Group to start that process. And they started in December with their first meeting and since have had three with two remaining with a projected timeline of March to have recommendations to the governor. The group is made up of seven representatives representing renewable energy, oil and gas, hunting and conservation, recreation, county conservation, landowners, and a county commissioner as co-chair with the governor's office. Those meetings are also streamlined with um, public opportunity to comment as well. To date, the three meetings that have transpired have mostly consisted of providing these seven panelists information and background on the Platte Valley Migration Corridor, presenting the science and um, understanding the mule deer in the area. And in the last meeting, some of the discussion from the panelists started, and the discussion mostly fell around um, what conservation practices to date have worked in this area. They talked a great deal about um, altering fences to make them wildlife friendly. They touched on wildlife crossing projects in the area, um, invasive species, and they also discussed the possibility of one of their recommendations to the governor is looking at these conservation practices to see which ones were the most effective in prioritizing them. So with that, we have two more meetings to go and we will um, be interested to see what recommendations come out of this local group to the governor's office. Meanwhile, in a parallel effort to follow through with commission and department policy, we are in the midst of the final stages of our draft um, biological risk and opportunity assessment related to the Platte Valley Corridor. And so Dr. Ember Hall is going to take over virtually here and present to you guys where we are with that plan and the steps she took to get there. Thanks, Angie. Um, hello, President Duby, Director Nesvik, and members of the commission. I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, President Duby, if you could just confirm for me that you can see those, see these slides when they come up, I'd appreciate that. We are there. Great. Thank you very much. So as Angie said, my name is Ember Hall. I'm the wildlife coordinator for the Laramie region and have been taking the lead on the draft biological risk and opportunity assessment for Platte Valley. I can get my slides to advance, that'd be helpful. There we go. So as many of you know, the Platte Valley is home to a spectacular and highly visible mule deer migration. And along with that, we have a strong and very interested and engaged constituency of people that care deeply about the Platte Valley mule deer herd. This herd was the second mule deer initiative herd identified by the state and shortly thereafter the Platte Valley Habitat Partnership or PVHP was formed. This group is a really interesting and diverse group of constituents. Um, every, everything from local government to um, sports persons to landowners to federal land management agencies, kind of the whole gamut engages in this group with the shared goal of putting habitat dollars and habitat enhancement work on the ground. And to date, they've been very successful, dedicating over $2 million to habitat projects in the Valley. Because of its reputation for producing high quality bucks, the Platte Valley is also a very highly sought hunting opportunity and in fact, demand for licenses uh, outstrips availability by quite a bit every year. So like many herds in Wyoming, the Platte Valley herd is made up of a lot of different migratory strategies. So there's some long distance migrants like those that are shown in blue on, the, on your slide that are migrating all the way from south of Saratoga down into northern Colorado, spending their summers around Zambi and along the uh, west front of the Rewas, so pretty long migrations. There's also a number of animals that engage in these more moderate migrations, which are equally important, such as animals that move from, say, the 
support steel brakes over to winter on the north end of the snowies. Um, so several different migration strategies, all of which play a crucial role in herd dynamics. Now, most of the herd within the Platte Valley is migratory, and so they're all wintering on this within the Platte Valley. But the really interesting thing about this herd is that they also spend their summers on pretty disparate summer ranges. So some are summering in the Snowies, some in the Sierra Madres, some are going all the way down to North Park, Colorado, and some may be moving north more towards I-80. And the, the key connection point between that winter range and those disparate summer ranges really is the designated migration corridor. So as Angie mentioned, in October of this year, uh, Game and Fish staff released to the public our draft biological risk and opportunity assessment. Uh, this is in compliance, of course, with the governor's executive order on migration and also with Wyoming Game and Fish Commission policy. So this document really has four goals and we'll just step through those briefly. The first is to analyze existing and potential threats. The second is to identify additional research needs. What other information do we need that we don't have about these animals? The third is to evaluate potential management actions and to prioritize those actions. And the fourth is to explore opportunities for proactive conservation. And this fourth piece is one that I feel like is, is really important and, a, and is a goal that the assessment should be serving in particular. So, We'll step through some of the challenges and opportunities that we considered for the assessment. And we looked at eight bio biological challenges and opportunities that we felt were, were really germane and important to this herd. So those are protected areas, zoning and development, fences, roads, energy development, trails and recreation, invasive species, and habitat improvement. So those are eight factors to play a strong biological role, both in terms of a challenge and in terms of an opportunity for this herd. So to give you a feel for what that looks like, pictured on the right-hand corner of your right-hand side of your screen is kind of the southeast portion of the Platte Valley designated corridor that's outlined here in, in pink. And then all of the cross hatching and colors that you see represent habitat improvement projects that our partners in the department have been able to put on the ground in the Platte Valley. So for example, that green color up kind of towards the center middle of your slide, that was a juniper enhancement project. The magenta color down kind of towards the lower center of the slide, that represents a shrub enhancement project. So lots of really great work already going on in the Platte Valley. And one of the spots where I think the assessment can really fill in is being able to, to identify those priority needs and capitalize on a lot of the habitat work that's been ongoing. So, to facilitate some site-specific recommendations in the document and also to kind of help us get our heads around um, where we are within the document, we divided the corridor into sort of sections. These are for organizational purposes only. Obviously, the, the corridor functions as a contiguous unit. The northern portion of the corridor includes um, segments A and B, and that's the Dana Ridge, Elk Mountain, North Platte, Code, and Pinnock areas. And the southern portion of the corridor consists of segments C, D, and E, and those are the Cedar Hills area, Beaver Hills, Bagot Rocks, and the Encampment River. Now, for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with the Platte Valley as, as some of us, the gray line running across the kind of the middle top of that figure is Interstate 80, and down in the lower portion of, of the figure is um, the Snowy Range on the right-hand side, and the Sierra Madres on the left-hand side or the west side of that designated corridor and Saratoga is kind of there in the middle. So we use these um, analysis segments to be able to, again, provide these site-specific recommendations. And we, we use each of these segments to analyze each of those eight risks and opportunities that I identified previously to look at how those are manifesting within these portions of the corridor. In accordance with the um, Governor's executive order on migration, we also evaluated and subsequently identified bottlenecks within the corridor. As you may remember, bottlenecks are defined as pinch points on the landscape, or more specifically, portions of a corridor where animals are significantly behaviorally or physically restricted. So we identified two after a fairly rigorous process. The first is in the Dana Ridge Elk Mountain area, and this is along Interstate 80. And as you can imagine, you know, it navigating Interstate 80 can be pretty difficult if you're a mule deer. Those that are able to do it use a network of existing um, culverts and underpass structures to be able to move from 
winter range north of I-80 down to the summer range on the um, south of I-80. So that was the first bottleneck that we identified. The second bottleneck is uh, within the Encampment River Canyon. And if any of you have been lucky enough to spend some time in the Encampment River Canyon, you'll recognize the picture in the center of your slides. So it's a, it's a gorgeous area, but it's also a really important topographical bottleneck because it narrows down to probably, oh, one to two miles wide, something like that, but provides a really important conduit from animals that are wintering in the Encampment River area, but spending their summers in uh, Northern Colorado. So, those are the two bottlenecks that we identified within the uh, designated migration corridor. So even though we're working from really rigorous GPS data that helped to form the footprint of the corridor, and we're matching that up with what we think are the best available data sets for all of those um, risks and opportunities that we identified, we know that there's a lot that we don't know. So we've really tried to work closely with the public in the development of this document so that we can take advantage of all of that information that private landowners, sports persons, interested citizens, government agencies know about this herd because they've been spending a lot of time engaged with these animals and, and where they live as well. So we've um, had a pretty extensive public outreach effort. Um, the goals of this effort have been sort of twofold. The first is just to gather feedback. You know, how are we doing on the assessment? Does it make sense? What else could we add to it? And then the second is to gain information about those proactive conservation opportunities. Where can we work together to get conservation on the ground for the benefit of the herd? So these outreach efforts have kind of run the gamut. Um, we mailed hard copies of the assessment to landowners uh, within the corridor footprints. We posted the assessment online along with a little video tutorial, um, worked with some local and state press, engaged on social media, and in early December, we also hosted a, a virtual public meeting to have a conversation about the assessment and what it looks like. Um, shortly after that meeting, we met with the Carbon County Board of Commissioners to, to get their feedback and provide them with a sense of, of the content of the document. And then, of course, as Angie mentioned, we've been working really closely with the governor's local working group. Their fourth meeting is scheduled, I think, a week from Friday. All right, so we've been getting some pretty good feedback on the document. We've been reviewing that as it's been coming in, um, but we're gonna take the next, oh, month or so to really give some good thought about how to take all of this feedback, put it into the assessment and make sure that we're considering the information that, that we've received. So taking in that public feedback and then also continuing to work with the working group and have an opportunity to incorporate their suggestions we anticipate that we'll finalize the assessment in early spring. So hopefully by late March, we'll have something available that's final and uh, available to be distributed to the public and more importantly used for the benefit of this herd. So that, that should be a, a brief overview of the assessment and uh, what we've done on it so far. And with that, if there's time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Amber. Uh, is there any comments for her? Any questions? Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we are going to skip to number 18. Chief Pip. Morning, President Doobie. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. Good morning, President Doobie, members of the commission. Uh, this morning for licensed selling agents, um, we have, um, we're, I'm, the department's going to ask you to vote to approve. Uh, we've got one new licensed selling agent, two transfers, and three renewals. Um, the, uh, the, the new licensed selling agent is Benedict's Trading Company, um, located uh, near Mountain View. Um, Mountain View's license sales from uh, are around $146,000 a year. Uh, the packet's in, um, that, that one looks real good. We've got uh, Anderson's Fly Shop uh, out of uh, Platte River, well, also known as Platte River's Fly Shop. Um, we've already got the temporary approval for the transfer um, and all the paperwork is, is in order on that one. Uh, including Commissioner Bird's approval. Um, 
the store's license sales were about $12,000 a year. We have a uh, fast stop, um, which is also known as Gardner's Country Village. Uh, again, we've got a temporary approval on that one. Um, the transfer uh, we have through uh, Commissioner Schmidt. Uh, the 2020 sales totals uh, about 100, correction, about $83,000 a year. And then we've got three renewals. Uh, we have Big D Oil in Laramie, uh, Wyoming, and their 2020 sales were uh, about $37,000 in 2020. Uh, we have Buckhorn Travel Plaza in Ranchester, um, and their annual sales are around $30,000 a year. And lastly, we've got a renewal for Buckboard Marina out of Green River, and their annual sales are about $26,000 a year. Barring any questions. Questions for Greg? I would entertain a motion. I second, Mr. President. Moved by Commissioner Brokaw, seconded by Commissioner Ryle to accept the department's recommendations on these transfers and renewals. Any public? Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Dave, thank you. Thank you. And I think we'll go to 19. Hey, Rebecca. Good morning, Commission President, members of the Commission, Director Nesvik. Sorry for not being able to join you in person. I'm expecting um, baby number two at any moment. So I didn't think anybody uh, really wanted to elect to take me to the hospital. So uh, good morning. Uh, Rebecca Fitzgerald, communications director for uh, the department. And I come uh, asking you today related to the volunteer policy. Uh, related to that policy, we are asked to vote and approve the uh, volunteer projects for the year, uh, which you have been included in your um, notebook. And so I ask that uh, we move those forward and approve as listed in the notebook and stand for any questions. Everybody had a chance to look at those? Anybody have any comments, questions for Rebecca? Okay, I would entertain a motion. I would move we uh, accept the department's recommendation. This item. I'll second. It's been moved by Commissioner Ryle, seconded by Commissioner Byrd to accept the department's recommendations on volunteer projects. Any comments from the public? Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, I guess we will break for one. Hey, Rebecca. Yes. Hold on, hold on one second. Sorry. You said good luck. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. I couldn't hear you. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, we will break for lunch and we'll be back at 10 to 1. So if okay. you can remember everything you just said 10 minutes ago, Scotty, that's what we're looking for. I wrote it down. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for waiting patiently. Please start over. Redbird. Commissioner President Duby, Commissioner Director Nesbick, our next commission agenda item is a damage claim appeal for damage claim number 21021. Mr. Carlon Knudsen from the Buffalo area is appealing the department's decision to deny his claim in amount of $9,807.50. The reason for the denial will be addressed by Buffalo Game Warden Jim Seaman, who investigated the claim. I believe Mr. Mr. Knudsen is uh, attending today either by Zoom or by phone, and Buffalo Game Warden uh, Jim Seaman is present today to present the department's investigation. If there are no uh, questions, we'll ask that Mr. Knudsen please present, address the commission with his information regarding his claim.
Mr. Knutson, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. So am I. Okay. Am I waiting for Jim to, to present, or or you want me to? No, go ahead yourself first. Uh, well, I guess there's a few things uh, as far as the denial of the claim. Uh, I just wanted the commission to be able to understand uh, the layout from the border of area two to area 129 uh, and my ability to kill a, a large volume of elk. Uh, there were two discrepancies on Jim's uh, paper statement that I received about not submitting the claim for deer, which is absolutely false. Uh, on two occasions, I spoke to Jim about deer and how to submit the claim. And I didn't reference the extent of the damage by the deer just because there were also so many elk on the meadow. I didn't feel that I could lay the blame solely on either deer or elk. And I spoke to him in person and then again about that over the phone. I did not claim fence damage to Jim Though on the application for the damage claim, it listed any and all damage needed to be mentioned, and that's why I listed that. My, my damage on the fencing wasn't excessive by any means. Uh, if you look at uh, cost of fencing is rated at $7,500 per mile. If you look at the BLM handbook, they rate an hourly rate for fencing at $45 per hour. So I felt that my estimate was very conservative. I guess uh, the only other thing was uh, I was asked by Jim not to turn in the damage claim until the end of the period, which Jim and I agreed would be the 24th of September when that was my shipping date and uh, my cows would have had access to the meadows at, after that point and we didn't want to keep doing a, an assessment of the elk herd after cows had entered the meadow. So I guess, I guess if there's any other questions, I would be happy to answer them. And All right. uh, you'll have ample opportunity to uh, speak again and respond. So uh, okay. this won't be the last time you have an opportunity to speak. Uh, at this point, before Jim comes up, is there any comments from any of the commissioners? I have some questions for Mr. Knutson. Okay. Mr. Knutson, Commissioner Crank has a couple questions. Okay. So, Mr. Knutson, it looks like part of the reason the department denied the significant part of your damage claim is that you did not allow enough hunter opportunity um, this year and last year. So I guess, can you explain to me how it, how you let hunters on and what your policies are and um, what you do with regard to your particular ranch operation with regard to allowing hunters on to kill some of the surplus elk and white-tailed deer that are obviously uh, eating your crops? The uh, so the discrepancy uh, in that part uh, is due to just solely the, the amount of landowner coupons that were turned into the Game and Fish last year. Uh, Jim told me that he received 14 landowner coupons for last 2019 hunting season. Um, whereas I killed 22 elk and allowed another, and I spoke to Jim over the phone about this asking him why 22 coupons weren't turned in. Uh, and he said that they, there was a potential that they could have been lost in the mail. So in his defense, I found two coupons in a coat pocket after I turned coupons into him, but that still doesn't account for the other six. Not only did I kill that many elk, I allowed another eight to 10 hunters and took them hunting and weren't, wasn't able to harvest an elk. And then on my damage claim application, I wrote 30 with a question mark. And that is because anybody and everybody that pulled upside alongside the road 
pulled into the yard and asked about shooting an elk, I allowed it. I told them, yeah, here's my contact phone number. I'm busy until Friday, come back in at four o'clock Friday or whatever, whatever I, you know, I tried to either give them a date, a phone number or a time that would be best suited for them to come and get an elk. And I did that to everybody. I didn't require a fee. I said, you show up at this time, we'll get you one. So, and, and I don't know those people's names. Jim told me that I could uh, give him a list of names that didn't kill an elk and use that on a damage claim. But he didn't notify me that until a phone call when he told me that the damage claim would be denied. So I don't know how to, I don't know how to give him a list of names. Those people had out of state plates, half of them. I, I didn't ask them for a name, you know, I just told them to come back on whatever day, so. And this year I did the same thing. I didn't receive a dime for elk hunting. This year I was able to kill 33 elk, um, but I extended invitations to anybody and everybody that I could think of to come and kill elk. The only two people that called me and, and I denied them the ability to kill an elk uh, was Janella Malley's daughter and a guy with a Kansas phone number. And they both had area two tags and they were calling me in October. And I, I didn't feel that I could, I didn't feel that I could, that I had the ability to get them an elk on the other side of the river that late in the season. And that was why I told them that I couldn't help them. If they would have had general area 129 tags, I would have been more than happy to get them an elk. And I killed elk this year all the way up until the last day of the season, which was November 30th. Tell me about your place. I mean, how many... How many acres do you own? Uh, the river bottom is roughly 4,400 acres. And we have some hills, uh, about 400 acres on area two, a little probably more than that, uh, maybe a thousand acres in area two. And then uh, I have a summer pasture that's seven miles off the river that's roughly 2,200 acres. And we were able to harvest eight elk, I think, in that pasture this year. Do you actually take these people out and try to... I take every single person out because I know how to hunt the property. I know how to guarantee, almost guarantee their success. And the other reason is that I face a liability. If I allow a person to go hunting without supervision and they cross a fence, and if they cross a fence into the neighbor and they break their leg or they roll a four-wheeler, that liability comes back to me and I don't want to have to deal with it. So I take them. And I say, you know, I don't charge them any, anything. I don't make them pay me for my gas, for my time. I don't do any of that. So I just don't want to have, I don't want to have it come back and bite me in the butt somehow. In, in, in the, this is Pat Crank again, but in, in our neck of the woods, we have problems where you kind of have what I call elk preserves where um, one rancher might allow hunting and once a couple shots are fired, they run to the neighbor's place who doesn't allow hunting and they hang out there for a while till they come back. And, and so is that a problem with your area where if you take people out and hunt, they'll get pushed off and then don't come back for a while. So is, is that a problem or have you experienced that, Mr. Knudsen? Uh, this year, late in the season, it did. And, and when I say season, I mean the general season from September 1st to November 30th. Uh, so my summer pasture is located seven miles in, 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 in a non-contiguous piece with the rest. So those elk get blown off the meadow and they go through seven miles of fences and get up in that, that second pasture where they rotate through. Uh, in that pasture, they, rot they rotate through three different neighbors and then the primary neighbor is is the is the landowner that's between our home property and the summer pasture and that property was hunted by tj taviji this year who killed 14 head of elk but i also allowed him and by extension any hunter that he had to shoot an elk on this property as well so talk to me about white-tailed deer i mean part of your claim involves white-tailed deer so uh, and that was a, and I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, you know, I'd ask you the same questions and I won't repeat them, but you know, do you, do you allow hunters to hunt white-tailed deer? Do you do it kind of the same way you do with elk? 
Um, same kind of question. The only stipulations I put on whitetail deer is is that I don't. Um, so those late season doe fawn tags, I don't generally take anybody after December. Now I don't think uh, I don't think that season was extended into December this year, but I, I could be mistaken. But a lot of a lot of years, the the bucks will start shedding horns in in late in mid December, and I and I don't want them to come in with a doe fawn tag and wind up killing a buck that just doesn't have a horn on its head. So that's the only stipulation I put on on whitetail. And I think last year I turned in 34 whitetail coupons. Maybe I could count the ones I have this year. I didn't I didn't I didn't pay attention to the count, but there's probably well over 20. I'm guessing. Mr. President, Mr. Knutson, that's all the questions I have. All right, thank you. Any other questions from the commissioner? Okay. I guess I might ask uh, Buffalo Game Warden Jim Seaman, please come forward and present uh, the department's findings and recommendation. President Doobie, uh, Director Nesbitt, Commissioners. Um, Mr. Knutson's claim had three issues that we looked at, that I looked at. Um, two of the issues that the denial were based on statutory. The third one was based on your commission regulations. And I'll go into those in a minute. Um, first, I'd like to say the Knutson property is an oasis for wildlife. Um, there are lots of elk there and lots of deer and antelope. It's irrigated meadows where there really aren't a lot of them close by along the Powder River. So the last several years, these elk have been coming in. Um, certainly, the Knutsons have, have damage. Um, and the reason for the denial, like I said, is commission regulations and statutes. So um, the first time he called me was August 15th. Um, and Carlin, they'd never put in for a damage plan. They, I delivered some damage fence to them several years ago, and even the previous game, we're gonna think they've ever put in for a damage claim. Previous to the elk the last few years, they've had lots of whitetail, hundreds of whitetail, and they've never put in for a damage claim. So this was new to Carlin, called me and asked me, what's the process, what do we do? And I asked him what's going on, and he said, well, we have lots of elk that ate nearly all of my second cutting. And I was surprised. Um, I asked him when they, they came down, he said, they've been here all summer since April. And I said, let's come out, I'll come out tomorrow. So um, I met him the next day on the 16th and we spent about two hours together. I gave him a copy of the regulations and statutes and we talked about what's required from the department, what's required from the landowner, um, how long the elk have been coming in. He said, uh, there's about 200, and then we counted out that same day with him with me. Um, we counted about 225, 230 elk that day along with, there were, there were lots of deer, but we didn't count deer. The, that primary our first meeting, all he talked about was elk and elk damage. He did tell me that the previous year, there were twice as many elk. There were 400 elk on his meadows all summer long. So I asked him, what's the difference? He had twice as many elk, and he said, well, the drought. You know, because of lack of moisture and rain, those elk are really having an impact on this summer. I said, okay. And I said, one of the, one of the, primary purpose besides game wardens investigating damage, especially for growing crops, is that we can mitigate the damage. We can try to prevent it or chase and harass or out, provide scare tactics and, and move them. And he had already harvested the second cutting, had already bailed them and stacked them in a stack yard. Um, so the department never had an opportunity to, to help out his damage, um, not only last summer, but the summer before. And he told me actually the summer before they had plenty of moisture, even though they had 400 elk. Um, it didn't bother them that much. Um, but I kind of went over the process that we'd like to know and we'd like to help you out. And uh, certainly I can move elk a lot easier than I can move antelope and deer. Uh, and I've moved elk miles away. And, and it works out pretty good sometimes. Sometimes you can move elk and they won't come back for weeks. So there was a process if they were on the fields all summer long that I potentially could have cut the damage down a lot. But uh, that's what we're saying. I said, look, I don't know if we can pay you for your lost bales, but we certainly possibly could do a consumption rate from this day on forward till your, the end of the growing season, which generally is 
whenever they stop, uh, the, the, the crops start growing, or uh, they, the first hard frost on something like alfalfa. So I said, you make that decision when the end of the season is, I'll start counting now. And I was only able to make three counts. One count actually was zero, and I think that was during the season, and they may have hunted them that evening before, but there was zero all coming out of that. So I had two good counts, and they're about the same, which the average is about 225 elk, and I focused on the adult cow, cows, um, how many adult cow, cows there were, and there was about 120 adult cows during those, those two counts. So one of the things we talked about is what the requirement in chapter 28 requires about adequate hunting. And um, it requires that a landowner that's experiencing damage require the, minim the minimum requirement is they have, to, they have to harvest the recruitment. And those aren't the, the calves or the fawns. Those are the animals that make one, to one and a half years old. That's what a population is growing by, is that recruitment. Those are animal, yearling animals that make it through a year and a half. And the only way to get that, and I told Carlin at the time, I couldn't get it until I talked to our wildlife biologist in Gillette, who had the classification results, I would get back to him to see what that was. And then we apply that recruitment index towards how many adult cows there are, and that's what they need to harvest. And that's in your commission regulations under chapter 28. Um, so again, recruitment's uh, individuals that are added to the population that year, year and a half age, Again, for this particular, when I got that number back, um, the biologist sent me that she classified 15 yearling bulls per 100 cows. So to get a total yearling classification, we, we just double that to account for the yearling females. And in my opinion, that's a little underestimated, but that's what we use. That's an easy number. You just double the yearling males. So in that herd, which is the fortification herd, there are 30 yearling animals per 100 cows out there. And that comes into why I counted the adult cows on the meadows. Okay, um, I, did, I do keep track on a, a database, all the landowner coupons that are turned in to me from all my landowners. Um, just the last five years, you can see the Knutsons have been killing elk. They, they didn't turn them in in 2017. Uh, last 2019, 14 out coupons were turned in. Uh, 2018, nine out coupons. Um, as far as lost in the mail, the landowners delivered to me in a big envelope. Um, and I don't lose them. I count them several times. Um, now, Carlin did say he, he knew he killed more than that, and that's possible. Um, he said he found at least one coupon in his coat pocket. So that's all I have to go by is 14 and, and 15. And then... Uh, Later, as far as the regulation, you'll see what, what is adequate hunting. We also include the hunters, like he said, that didn't harvest anything, but he allowed to go. And I'll get to that one. Let's go to the next one. As far as the fence damage and white-tailed deer damage, when I first went out with Carlin, we spent two hours around. All we focused on is elk. There were clearly lots of deer in the fields, but Carlin said, I, I'm just concerned about elk damage. Um, so I really didn't, I didn't count and focus on elk. I didn't get the classification routes, routes for deer. I didn't get the classification results for deer. Um, I, didn't even, I, I did count deer one time when I was out there counting elk just to see how many there were. And there were 196 white-tailed deer on the meadows. But uh, Carlin, and I, I know what he's getting at, is he had both elk and deer on the meadows, and this is how much hay he lost. But all I focused on was the elk. And, and the fence damage, um, the only time we talked about fence damage was I offered to start moving the elk immediately on the 17th or 16th. I said, let me come out, I'll start pushing them. And at least he told me sometimes he gets a third cutting. And I said, okay, I'll come out and I can start tomorrow and I can run them all the way across the river. And, and if they stay away for a week, I only have to do it a few times and you'll have a pretty good, you might be able to get a third cutting. At that point, he said, you know, you're just, probably gonna run them through the fence and damage the fence. So I just assume you not damage the fence. Um, and, he, and he did say his father had two clients coming in to hunt out the first week in September, and this was only two weeks away. So he said, I, I just don't know if I want the elk run off. And I said, okay, I'll just count them. 
when I get the results from the biologist, when I get the average, which would be in September, then I'll apply the recruitment to see if enough harvested. And I let them know that it's based on if you allowed enough harvest. Um, authorized hunting season, most of our damage claims on growing crops are in the summertime. So when we talk about authorized hunting season, we're talking about last year, the previous year's hunting season. Um, it says any hunting season in the previous 12 months. Now, there comes up a question now, if you wait on a damage claim and put in in November, December, did the previous three months count towards that? Did the harvest count towards that? Um, and I'll leave that up to you. Um, like I said, most damage claims that I deal with are in the middle of the summer. And so we just look at the previous, previous fall hunting season. If those animals were the same animals, if they were present there, was there adequate hunting on that property to reduce or to meet the recruitment to reduce the population? And this is the section in section 28 that talks about does this have a I should. I'll read the whole thing. Department shall determine if hunting is permitted during operating hunting seasons for the species of the city of the danger for which a verified claim has been filed. For an award to be allowed, the department shall have to determine if they have sufficient hunt numbers of hunters to access private property or join the state and federal to harvest more than the number of daily and federal amounts of danger included in the state preceding 12 months. So we're looking for more than that recruitment. But the number I'll come up with is minimum. That's what we're looking for more than that. Part. And it does say for the preceding 12 months for the animals being damaged. Now that's, you gotta understand that if those animals are present during hunting season, then we assume that they will try to reduce that population. Again, on the, the counts that I did, the average were, there was 225 average total elk. 120 were the adult cows. So if we take that 30 yearling ratio, multiply it times 120, that would mean 36. So he'd have to harvest 36 elk or allow enough hunters to harvest that. And, and, and that comes into play where if you have cow calf licenses where a hunter can get two or possibly three licenses. All we care is was there adequate hunting enough to meet that requirement. Again, 36, um, they turned in 14, he allowed another, he told me allowed another six, six to eight hunters, that's up to 22, 23. Um, it, it's, it's short of 36 needed. Bottom line is that that's why this part of the claim was denied. So Elk Area 29, the, the Knutson of property has land on both sides in area two and 129. These are area two elk, but they spend a lot of time on the meadows, which are in 129. The creek's right there, within 100 yards of his irrigated meadows. So they're going back and forth. So we use classification results in area two. Um, and that's where we come up with that yearling index of 30 yearling animals per 100 cows. As you can see, area 129, where the elk were most of the time, it's a very liberal season. They could start rifle hunting September 1st all the way through November. So it's a three month season. In addition to that, we've allowed cow calf licenses where a hunter like Carlin himself can get another two extra licenses. So if, if a landowner has only a certain amount of friends or family wants to allow a hunt, but he needs to meet that recruitment, say he needs to kill 30 animals, if he had 10 family and friend members that had three licenses each, that would qualify. This part of, of the regulation um, also coincides with the statute, which means we need to be notified of the damage within 15 days that it occurred. Um, we never talked about deer damage. Um, we did over a phone call, like Carlin said, and he'd asked me, and this was after I'd done all the counts and gave him the form and he was ready to, he asked me, should I put in for deer? And I said, yeah, I, you know, I didn't count or classify deer. I did one cursory count. But I said, you can put in for any damage you want. Um, so that's why he put in for deer damage. Um, again, with fence damage, uh, this regulation applies, even the statute applies. I didn't even verify, I didn't even investigate the fence damage. 
We never went and looked at it. All we talked about is if I moved out, the elk would destroy some fence. So those two, the white-tailed deer and the fence damage, I believe that's statutory. And I, I just, that, that's why it was denied on that one. And this regulation kind of mirrors that, that. We have to be able to investigate the damage. I didn't do any counts on deer because we were focused on elk and that's what he told me was bothering him the most. So, just a nuisance claim for elk on growing field. This is the majority of his claim. This has to do with uh, regulation. These two, I think, were denied based on this statute. Um, they, they weren't investigated. They weren't allowed. I wasn't able to look at it. So, we denied it on, on, two, on statute and regulation. This is his overall claim uh, $8,437.50 for alfalfa. Although, you know, he did say deer were involved in that, and they certainly were. I mean, between the counts I saw, the deer and antelope, there was probably 400 animals on these three, three center pivots. That's the majority of my presentation. Any questions? Thank you, Jim. Any questions? Mr. President. Commissioner Crank. Jim. Uh, so the... Mr. Knutson claimed that he lost 56.25 tons of alfalfa grass at $150 per ton. Um, is that, I mean, I, is that accurate? Mr. Crank, that's very accurate right now. Okay, so you don't, you don't dispute that that's probably what all these animals ate, I guess is the million dollar question. Yeah, as far as what, you know, I'm sure they ate a lot. Uh, the consumption rate, we never got into that. If I was to go that route, if he qualified, you know, elk eat 14 some pounds a day, deer equal, you know, um, was it elk, deer, just elk, just deer? Was it drought conditions too? Antelope. Um, but you don't, you don't think that's an outlandish oh, I don't think $150 estimate. a ton is outrageous, no. Okay. Any other questions at this point? Mr. Knudsen, do you have anything to comment on? Sorry, yes, sir, I do. Go ahead. Uh, so the drought conditions didn't interfere. <clears throat> the, the drought conditions don't come into play under irrigated meadows. Those, those meadows were irrigated. <clears throat> and the same amount of water was hitting the complete circle, whereas the river side of the meadow was two inches tall the house side of the meadow was 18 inches tall. That was the difference. Uh, I also did tell Jim that I was gonna report 200 head of deer and asked him if he thought that number was accurate and he agreed. And, and just the basis that the claim was denied based on insufficient funny, hunting from the previous year um, because this is my first application for a damage claim. Now, I don't, I don't mind the elk. I like them. I think they're uh, very pretty and fun to watch. And I take my kid out and just video them. Um, but this year they interfered with my ability to run a business. And that's what I told him. And I, and I told Jim that, that in a, on a better year, I probably wouldn't have claimed the damage. I don't believe in frivolous claims. If it wouldn't have interfered with my ability to, to, put up enough hay to feed my cows, it wouldn't have probably been a problem. So I also did tell Jim that the damaged fence on the outside border of the property is still damaged. Other than uh, I replaced two braces and put in a new gate that had, get, had gotten broken half, most of that damage on that outside portion is still there. And I offered for him to come and look at it. The, all of the fencing rates that I put on the damage claim were, were for the interior fences uh, protecting the hay meadows from the river bottom pasture. And the reason that I do that is because the elk blow holes in that electric fence and then my cows get on the meadow overnight and say for instance three years ago I lost seven head of cows due to bloat because I couldn't keep the fences up. I couldn't keep up. I didn't want to replicate that, and I and I haven't. Luckily, I haven't since then. But um, th this has been an ongoing problem for the last ten years. 
the other the other issue I had uh, with Jim's statement was that I told him that the bulls come in. The bulls come in in April. There were 68 head of bulls just alone without a cow up until uh, around the last week of June, between the last week of June and the second week of July. And that's when the cows and calves start coming in. And and that's when they that's when they really start hitting the meadows. That's when there's 150 plus head every day, sometimes morning and night, sometimes three in the afternoon. In fact, they walk around underneath my pivots as the pivots rotate through the meadow just to stay inside the water. I don't know if they do it to fight flies or what. Yeah, uh, Mr. Knutson, I don't think there's any concern from the commission, at least in my mind, about that they're causing damage. Uh, I think that's 100%. I think Jim is saying the same thing. My question okay. is, to you is, do you understand the procedure going forward as, as to how the department has to to handle these types of damage claims and what you, you need to do so that you can be fairly compensated for the damages of wildlife creating? Have you, have uh, you got an understanding it learned through this process, how it works? I absolutely did not understand the process. Or no, no, I mean now. now. I'm talking about from here forward. From here forward, I how believe. this process works so that you can you can do it in the future if you would like to, uh, so that we can try to get you everything that you, uh, the damages that the wildlife are doing to your place. Do, do you understand from here forward how the process works? I believe I believe so. Yes, I do. Uh, and and I I want to apologize because I'm 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 not trying to blame Jim for any any fallback. It's just that the, because this is my first time of trying to get through the process that could be why my application was denied just because I didn't know any better. So you're I'll not take, the first person to have these types of issues with a, with a new claim. Uh, most of the time we're not, we're not arguing with you or have any, any argument over the actual damages. It's just the statutes and regulations that our, our field personnel have to uh, have to abide by. And, and once you know the process, I think it will work out quite well. Is there any other questions? Mr. President, I have a question. Mr. Brokaw. Um, I'd like to talk about a strategy moving forward uh, from you, Warden Seaman, and, and of course the landowner. It seems like there's a bottleneck in allowing hunter opportunity here. Uh, we, we obviously have an overabundance of animals in the area. We've got prime habitat. Um, we've got liberal allocations of tags. How can we work together and increase harvest and provide more opportunity? President Doobie, Commissioner Brokaw, I think Commissioner Crank kind of hit the nail on the head. Uh, we have pockets of preserves. Um, it's not so much the case in this area. Uh, the neighbors do a pretty good job. Knutsons do a great job at starting this year. Um, but you just kind of hit on a point that we're all battling with and we're struggling with that. Um, you know, we, we could talk for a couple hours over a couple beers and I could give you a lot of pointers or opinions, but it's it's a it's a struggle. Um, but I think in this area, the landowners out there on the Powder River are doing a pretty good job. Um, clearly, Mr. Knudsen's harvested more elk than anybody, any of his neighbors, this year, this year, um, and and that's a start. And um, I know I had several calls of people looking for cow that had general licenses or that 129 type six, and I sent them out there. And I don't know if, if those people made it out there or not, but part of it, it's this cooperation between gaming fish and landowners and, and helping each other out. But, um, it's, it's a struggle in some places. Anybody else? Uh, I'd have something to add to that if I could. Sure. Uh, so this is a conversation that I've had with several game wardens, several game and fish representatives, um, uh, and I've and I brought it up to Jim as well, who uh, didn't I, I didn't know it before I talked to Jim, but uh, there are certain things that maybe collectively could be done. Um, of course, the game and fish would have to do it, but that would be by extension of general season dates into area two, or perhaps strictly 129 season dates but further further back into august and i i've told jim this but the only other things that i could possibly do are hunt elk with a spotlight what's a no-no 
<laughs> cross the river into area two during the general season, which is a no-no. Or uh, the third thing that I can do is, and I've tried and I've applied through the ATF for silencers, for, for muzzle suppressors on the rifle, because I think that that could be my only other potential way to kill more elk than I already do. So if that, if maybe changing some season dates or maybe having a area two season dates coincide with the general season dates, uh, that could potentially be a big boost in the amount of elk we could get on the ground. So. Mr. President, Mr. Craig, I'm prepared to make a motion so we can have a discussion. Or I would move that we compensate Mr. Knutson in the amount of his claim $9,687.50. And then I, I have some reasons that I'd like to explain why. Wait a second. I second that, Mr. President. Okay, it's been moved by Commissioner Crank, seconded by Commissioner Rael to pay the full claim. Any more discussion? discussion? Yes, Mr. President, I would like to hear from Commissioner Crank on the justification of the fence being awarded. Commissioner Crank? Um, well, that, I'll, I'll address that. But, um, you know, it, Jim ab absolutely did what he needs to do as a Wyoming game warden pursuant to statutes and rules and regulations. So. Jim, in making that motion, I'm not doing anything that I believe you didn't do anything exactly other than what we would ask you to do in your position. You know, we have to have these kind of technical rules so that we can try to apply the law equally across, you know, a variety of landscapes, a variety of situations. And, um, you know, sometimes a technical application of the rules, um, particularly with regard to Mr. Knutson, who's never filed one of these claims before, um, can lead to a harsh result. And so I'm trying to remedy that harsh result. Um, you know, I, I'm not an elk biologist, I'm not an expert, but I do know that we have this problem that Jim agreed with me on that we have elk preserves and one shot and the elk thunder off. And I personally witnessed for 60 years or 50 years anyway, elk don't just jump over a fence all the time, they destroy it. And so it's not beyond the kin to me, Ralph, that when he's trying to hunt these elk on his hay meadows and they get out of there, that they're gonna destroy the fence and he has to repair it. So, um, and I, you know, I just think that it sounds like Mr. Knutson, and I haven't heard anything different, is trying to take people out on his ranch and, and alleviate the problem. He didn't quite meet the 36 elk or hunter opportunities that he, he needed to technically comply with the statute, but you know, we're in the mid twenties. He he's letting people on to try to remedy the problem. And so I just think this commission has discretion to um decide these damage claims. And I think we have a, a landowner who's trying to remedy the problem. We have a game warden who's busting his ass to do what he needs to do under the statutes and, and solve the problem. And we have a cooperative relationship that's already in existence and will grow over time. And we have educated Mr. Knutson that he needs to take pictures of his damaged fence before he repairs it. And, and you know, when he lets these people on his ranch, he needs to write down their name and their address and their phone number so he can document that he's getting the kill necessary to comply with the statute. So that's why I think we should award the whole full amount. Commissioner Brokaw, do you have a response? Uh, my concern, Mr. President, and I don't know if the precedence of, of repairing fences on all the claims I've seen up to this point in my tenure, we don't award for that kind of damage. And so this is new to me. And I didn't know how that statute 23-19 uh, applied. So I wasn't clear if, if that was an eligible practice we could pay on. I knew the damage of crops was, and I am rising in support of Pat and his motion to do that. I'm just not sure about the, the inner fences like that. Uh, Mr. President. I guess, if I may, Mr. President. Yes. 
if, if my memory uh, serves me right, if, if, uh, I cannot remember the, the commission meeting, but there was a gentleman in, in Farson, Wyoming, that, that uh, actually has gone through the same thing. It's his first claim. It was his first claim, and uh, he had we had denied him compensation too, and and. Uh, being as how there was a relationship and an effort and uh, a concerted effort, not just something that he he pulled out. He worked with the game and fish uh, diligently to to uh, go through the right process. And in any event, it was it was denied, and we went ahead and compensated him. And I think uh, uh, this gentleman here, uh, Harlan, has has gone through the process and may have. Uh, I don't want to say. From, for, for non-compliance, but just because of lack of, of knowledge, uh, things got, things fell through the hoop. And I think uh, he's, he's at least complying, making every effort to comply and, and go through the process. So that's my argument with this. We did it for one. I, I We kind of set a precedent in my mind. This will be the last time I get to vote on that, but in any event, that's where I stand. Does, does that remember, do you remember that? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Bird, I agree with a lot of what you've said. I think he is trying to do quite a bit. I have a problem with awarding the entire amount, though, because he had a chance to let Jim run the elk out, and he wouldn't let him. So he lost two weeks of crops there because he wouldn't let Jim move the elk out. And I know he had his reasons, but still, he denied letting them move them out and now asking for full compensation on his losses. I'm really not comfortable with that. Mr. President. Commissioner Crank. Okay, Lynn, I'm not a rancher or farmer. I try to raise tomatoes, but the hail kills them every summer. Um, so if you have a different figure you wanna suggest for the crop damage, I would certainly entertain amending my motion. Um, so. Look back. I, I, I'm, certainly entertain that I maybe the second would entertain it but you, you make a valid point Galen that maybe this could have been remedied a little bit but my problem with your motion is I have no qualms about the actual damages I'm, that that occurred but the problem is we have rules and regulations and we can't just send our people out there with that in their toolbox and then continually override what they say you want to do. I have no problem with compensating in some form, some fashion, but I do believe Mr. Knutson does share the onus on some of this. Um, I bet you next year it's going to be, every T is going to be crossed and every I is going to be dotted. It's going to be perfect. But I think in this particular case, it's, it does not send a good message to our field people when we continually override their work. If that's the case, then we need to change the statutes. We, we need to change how that works. I do believe that we need to compensate Mr. Knutson for some of these damages. I do. I mean, if I had a vote, I would I would prefer the, the elk damages only at this time. But that's that's my comment on the situation. I, I just feel I have no qual I mean the damages I, I agree. It, it's a I've seen that area many times. I ranch not too far from there. There's a lot of elk, it's a big problem. Huge problem. Um, but because of this we have procedures, we have things to follow. And we need to either follow them or, or, or make them or change them. Anyway, that's just my. Mr. President, this commission is going to change. We know that. So uh, I guess I would I would say that's that's uh, uh, up to you guys in the future. I think uh, I, I would hate to deny this uh, Harlan anything uh, like we did not deny the gentleman from Parson. So. Uh, I, I, I agree with you, Pete. There's been a precedent set here that, that we, we don't want to uh, tell our people they're not doing a good enough job and we don't believe them. No way, no way. That's not the case here. I just think that uh, it's the gentleman's first claim and I think we need to take that into high consideration. So two weeks of forage on elk, that could be nullified like that in a heartbeat if there were more elk than what uh, we're claiming or he's claiming. Am I right? Two weeks of forage out there that we're, we're saying uh, he had an opportunity to, uh, uh, the 
our department had an opportunity to haze the elk and get him out of there, right? But he did not do that for two weeks or something like that? Is, it, is that what we talked about? I think it was my understanding he didn't want to because there was hunters coming in in two weeks. Understand that then. I don't know the date, you know, maybe if it started hazing them out then, maybe there would have been a small, small loss. I mean, I, I don't know the dates on that to compare it. But just due to all the regulations, the way things were done, all things considered, I'm having a hard time wanting to pay too much money and get get all the, uh, like you say, the precedent set. We've got to kind of follow our regulations and statutes as well. By the same token, this is a gentleman that's taking people out elk hunting to, to um, manage the herd. So that's what makes it difficult because he's trying. He's going way above and beyond. I just don't know where that line is to not just totally do away and disregard our regulations and rules that it, they've been put there for a reason. Mr. President, do be two quick things. I'll, Jim will address the actual tonnage loss and, and what that was quite important to address Commissioner Brokaw's question. The department does pay for fence for materials and fair market value on labor to fix fence. So that is a damage item that we do compensate for. Thank you. So I'll have um, Jim Seaman talk about maybe clarify that. Yeah, yeah President Doobie, Commissioner Bird, even though I wasn't allowed that two weeks from August 17th through when they're first hunters, the damage claim, I believe, that the, the tonnage that Mr. Knutson put in for was the second cutting. Um, he told me he possibly could get a third cutting, um, but that's not what he put in for. It was just what he lost in the second cutting. So on his claim itself, it probably wouldn't have made a difference um, if I would have moved him because it was just his second cutting that he was short. That's what he was short. But they'd been in there pretty much all summer, correct, before he... Um, turned him in. Unless I misunderstood Commissioner Bird, when I first met him, he said all the elk have been in there since April. Now he said maybe it was just the bulls, and that could have been my misunderstanding. But even if the cows started coming in in June, that's most of the growing season. Yeah, so in my mind, it should have been addressed then. Mr. Jim, uh, I thank you for your hard work and effort. I think it's, it's uh, uh, very, very good, and I, I don't mean to sound like I might be second-guessing your your decision at all, by no means, okay? And okay. Jim, neither am I. You did exactly what we would have hoped you would have done, and you held the warden, and it's <clears throat> just we're dealing with this problem of an over huge overpopulation of elk, with some landowners let them have preserves, some landowners hunt, and, and we're stuck in the middle of this fluctuating elk herd, you know, and 95% of our wildlife lives on private land, you know, pick, pick a percentage, but we're not, you know, we will not have the wildlife resources we currently have unless we have solid landowner partners. And it seems to me, Mr. Knudsen's a pretty good guy and we ought to help him out here. But, and I think you'll see a whole different claim next year. And maybe we do need to change the regulations and and the statutes, but we're talking about 10 grand. Um, so. If I, if I could uh, address, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, ma'am. Uh, you Commissioner Bird. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, so um, the reason I didn't allow Jim to chase the elk out uh, was for one, he, he mentioned a firecracker gun and this being a record drought year I, I was trying to get away from the potential of causing a wildfire. And, and my second concern with that was when you chase elk, they destroy things. So a lot of times when you let them meander on and off a field, they'll jump the fences, they'll go around to the gates, you know, stuff that they wouldn't do if they were being chased. And the other thing was, uh, I like the elk. I don't have a thing against elk or wildlife in general but where do you draw the line from where do you draw the line from having elk to them causing damage and that's that's why when i noticed the damage was when i put up the second cutting of hay that was when i noticed a, an obvious difference from one side of the crop circle to the other so though i i knew the elk had been there prior to that i didn't understand the extent that they were damaging the fields until i notified jim okay thank you for that 
You're welcome. Thanks, ma'am. Commissioner Brokaw, one more question. Mr. President, um, a question for the um, Mr. Knudsen. Um, are these circles in such a way that if we directed department staff to high fence your your circles, uh, would you be willing to do that? And my point is this, we have a pile of these damage claims to go through and Pete makes a great point. We just can't keep paying and paying and paying. We've got to start finding some solutions, whether it's high fence, increased hunter harvest, something. And I just wondered if you would be receptive um, to fencing some of the, your crop. I would be open to reviewing that. I, I kind of am of the opinion that because of the way the river rotates and cuts sections of ground out where where we we have trouble fencing the river bottom just because on a on a flood year it'll take 60 or 80 yards of bank off, off and take it away uh, i would i would encourage the game game and fish to possibly do a study on that and see just how much expense you would have to go to to get that done i i would i would guess that the expense of doing that would be more than the benefit of doing that but but i i would leave that up to you to decide it's been our policy not to do that. We tried to fence up a pumpkin patch and it's not working too well. But it's been the game of fish policy not to do that because that leads to a whole lot of, I don't disagree with you. I think there should be some way to figure that out. But we'd have to fence off a lot of hay meadows across the state. It would yeah, cost so more than our budget probably. So noted. Yeah. Anyways, uh, we have a motion. I've called for the more. question. Any more discussion on the motion? which is to authorize the full damage claim, correct? Correct. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. Aye. All right, we'll have a verbal vote. All those for? Okay. Aye. 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 Those against? Aye. 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 I'll vote against as well. So we can either make another motion on this or that'll be the termination. Does well, somebody I'm, want to make a, another nominee? Having motion? lost, I will make a second motion um, that we compensate, Miss, and this is totally arbitrary and capricious, um, that we compensate Mr. Knudsen $4,000 for his damage. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded by Commissioner Crank. Make the motion. Commissioner Brokaw seconded to authorize $4,000. Discussion? That's half. I think it deserves more than half. So I would, I would uh, not to be contrary to what you suggested or, or motion, Pat, but I would say 6000 Can I make an amendment? No. No? I mean, you can, but I'm, I'm going to reject that. I made the motion for four. I think we need to move this on. So if you want to, we'll see, let's see what happens with that motion and you can make your own motion. I think is the way it works. Any more discussion on that? The motion is to authorize $4,000. All those in favor, we'll do an oral hand wrote, vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Mr. Knutson, you've been authorized to $4,000. And Mr. Edberg will uh, tell you the situation in any other issues regarding that. Yes, thanks, Commissioner. I'll reach out to Mr. Knutson. I'll have Jim Seaman reach out to him and tell him what the official process is next and, and uh, take it from there. But thank okay. you, Commissioner, for your thank time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knutson. Thank you for your time. On agenda number 11, Ian, is he going to be virtual? Oh, there he is. You're up. Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the commission, Director Nesvik. I'm pleased to be here today to talk to you about the uh, statewide mule deer initiative and the Platte Valley Habitat Partnership 
projects for 2021. Uh, my name is Ian Tater. I'm the statewide terrestrial habitat manager. Uh, as, a, as a way of background, the Mule Deer Initiative funding started in 2016, and uh, we, were, we were lucky enough to have uh, the first five years of funding. We're now in year one of the second five years of funding, thanks to the Commission's generosity. And I'm here today to talk to you about uh, projects that fit under the scope of the statewide Mule Deer Initiative. So we've got 16 projects today occurring in nine out of the 10 Mule Deer Initiative herds. As you can see here, uh, these are pretty well distributed throughout the state. We've got projects occurring uh, in, in many of our Mule Deer Initiative herds, like I mentioned, nine out of 10. Uh, you can see them here distributed uh, throughout the state on this map. Why don't we jump right in? Um, the very first couple that, that I'm here to talk to you today about is uh, Wyoming Range Fences. This, uh, this is two different projects, one of which is 17 miles south of Kemmer, the other is four miles northeast of Cokeville. Uh, the goal here is to improve mule deer movement corridors between seasonal ranges. We're talking about a total of 12.2 miles of fence. You can see here, this is, uh, you may not be able to see that very well, but there is a fence in that picture. Uh, it's not wildlife friendly. And uh, certainly the, the map on the left there indicates just how important this area is for mule deer. So that's crucial, uh, crucial range in that uh, mustard colored uh, there. And you can also see where the fence occurs in conjunction with that. Uh, the second uh, project that we're gonna talk about today uh, for, these, for these two is Queely Reservoir fence reconstruction. Uh, this is uh, another fence that, that certainly is uh, an important one for, to, to modify from a mule deer perspective. So total of 10.7 miles, uh, and that's the division between the Albert Creek and Uinta Cumberland allotments, and then a mile and a half uh, north of Queely Reservoir. Again, separating two different grazing allotments. Both areas are crucial winter ranges. Uh, they do impede migration. Uh, we're gonna replace these non-wildlife friendly fences with wildlife friendly ones. And certainly this endeavor is supported by our, our local permittees. As you can see here, we have a variety of funding sources uh, that have pulled together to try and make this happen, including, uh, I will point out the Lisi, Permittee, and Kind. They're gonna do the majority of this work and uh, certainly need some, some help to pull it off. We've got BLM, WWNRT, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, NIFWIF, et cetera. Um, go back, the Mule Deer Initiative request to the commission today is $27,500 to retrofit both of these fences for, with a total project cost of nearly $400,000. Moving right along, and I, I will go fast. Feel free to, to interrupt me. I've got nearly 70 slides I'm trying to get through. So if you have questions or, or need clarification, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to go back and, and talk about it. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about today is the Grays River cheatgrass. So this is in the Wyoming range. Uh, this is off um, Grays River Road. And we've recently found a, a few small pockets of cheatgrass totaling about 600 acres here. This is really important country for, for deer and lots of other animals. Um, you can maybe see on this map uh, where, they, where those projects occur. Um, you can see here. Um, and then uh, I really do like this photo uh, depicting kind of where, where our slopes are. And so you can see these small areas, really each of these are, are pretty, pretty small on the landscape, but uh, often south facing slopes where we get that first, uh, first flush of cheatgrass. We're gonna go in and take care of those right away. Mr. President. Ian, are we using our high dollar equipment on these cheatgrass locations? Mr. President, I, I guess I'm not, completely sure what we're <laughs> what you're referring to but uh, yes lidar oh uh yes sir um we are trying to use lidar in lots of ways as, as you well know um that's not how we pick these ones up though initially this is our local folks finding them on the ground that's that's how we found these these pockets i know you found them but are, are you you know one of the reasons for using that is, is so you don't broad blanket do the whole area you try to do the area that needs it the most so are we using or going to be using that the, the high dollar imagery mr president we absolutely will be using 
uh, every available resource, including modeling and imagery, uh, to find these pockets just like this. So yes, the answer would be. Okay, so uh, small pockets, we're, we're, we're early days on this one. We want to catch it before it gets big. That, that is the point of, of catching these early. Uh, what, we, what we refer to that is uh, early detection, rapid response. So you may, it's, it's a similar principle as, as we might have run into with AIS. We want to catch these things early. And so that's, that's what we're doing here. Um, as you can see here, really important part of the world. Uh, we, we have a concern about cheatgrass, and, and I think we can come in here and, and get these small patches knocked out before they become big patches. Luckily, we have the ability to use the, the new uh, best chemical available to us, Rejuvra, on this one, and uh, aerial application as well. We feel really good about our, our potential success here. Uh, current and anticipated funding partners include Governor's Big Game License, WWNRT, and uh, certainly our weed and pest partners and a little bit of Forest Service money. Uh, total request to the commission, $20,000. Again, this one is, is not as well leveraged as, as many of our others. I will point that out, but uh, it's because we're early days and we want to get in here and get this thing uh, caught before it gets away from us. Moving right along to Bates Hole. So we've got a project uh, that we've been pulling together in Bates Hole. This is an area of the, of the state that we've done a lot of work historically. Um, and so this is 30 miles south of Casper. Uh, we're, we're focusing our energy around the riparian health. And so about 1500 acres scheduled for treatment. Here's the entirety of the Bates Hole area. It's a little bit hard to see on this map, um, but we've got, you've, You've seen me talk about Little Red Creek and, and Corral Creek and other areas here before. Um, this is this just kind of gives you a, an overview. Uh, this is really important winter year long winter and year long range. Um, we're going to go in and, and work on juniper thinning, salt cedar removal, and also do some beaver dam analogs. And so I'll show you a picture of a beaver dam analog here in a second. So we're going to go in with chainsaw crews and remove the junipers. Uh, we're going to use chemicals to treat salt cedar uh, along these, these narrow areas in a very dry, this, this area in general is very dry. Uh, these riparian areas are, are really, really important. Um, and we're going to use BDAs to restore floodplain connectivity, raise that water level. Uh, so I told you I'd show you a picture. Here we have a, a beaver dam analog in the top picture in action. Uh, that's our uh, local folks there installing one. Um, these really do work and they don't cost a lot of money. And uh, we've been really pleased with them so far. We're gonna roll out quite a few more uh, as we move forward. The bottom picture is, is showing uh, the state of, of juniper uh, encroachment throughout <laughs> a lot of places in Wyoming look a lot like that. Um, $50,000 mule deer initiative request on a $162,000 project, lots of good, uh, other funders, we're pretty excited about this one. You've heard me talk uh, before about the Grizzly WHMA uh, and our efforts there to retrofit the fences on the Grizzly WHMA. Uh, this occurs in the BAGS Mule Deer Initiative uh, herd unit in both the Green River and Laramie regions. Um, this is uh, about just shy of 38,000 acres contained within the WHMA. Really wanted to show you and, and bring to your attention this map um, that kind of shows you what we've, what we've been able to accomplish thus far and what we still have left to do. So there's 55 miles of fence on the Grizzly WHMA. Um, as you can see here, we've got a fair amount done. Uh, the red indicates areas where we still have fences that do not meet wildlife friendly specifications. And so we've got more to do. It's a little hard to see in this light, but um, the green uh, indicates uh, the, the corridor itself stopover areas are even harder to see, at least for me from this angle. But uh, I mean, it, it shows you just how important this country is for, for uh, migrating mule deer, stopover areas for mule deer, and trying to make that as passable as we, as we possibly can is really the goal. And, and we're moving quite, quite ahead on that. So um, Yeah, we've, we've done about 25 miles, as, as we mentioned. Um, still hard at it, and, and this money here will help us uh, continue in that endeavor. So we've got a total project cost of $441,000. We're looking uh, for another 40000 from the commission. 
really great list of partners. I mean, from energy development to NGOs to federal dollars, um, uh, the leasees, we've got, we've got lots of folks involved in, and excited about this project. And, and we're excited to, to continue to move it forward as well. Hopefully I didn't hit the wrong button. Let's see. Okay. Moving right along, Mullen Wildfire Cheatgrass Control. So you're going to hear me talk about the Mullen Wildfire Cheatgrass twice today. And the reason for that is this fire was so big, it crossed two different mule deer initiative herd boundaries. And so on the Sheep Mountain side, we're talking about 5,700 acres of, of cheatgrass control. At the end of the presentation, we'll circle back and talk about the Platte Valley side because that's a different pot of money. But for now, we'll, we'll focus our energy around the Sheep Mountain side near Albany. We really have a, a rare opportunity here to, to come in post fire and, and do a lot of good. And uh, that's, that's what our intent is. You can see in the picture here, we, we had a, a fair amount of mixed severity within this fire. Uh, that might look like the surface of the moon, but not everywhere looks quite like that. Um, but this was a big fire. It was uh, 176,000 acres. I did a little bit of digging last night because I was curious. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this is the third largest fire to ever occur in Wyoming. Uh, the first largest, of course, would be the Yellowstone fires. Uh, the second largest fire, according to, to what I could pull out, was a fire that occurred in 1876 in the Bighorn Mountains, which was about 500,000 acres. And then this one, I think, is, is number three. Um, so we're, we're hoping to, to take some immediate action here, go in and spray these areas where we know we've got a cheatgrass issue and nip that in the bud. Uh, we were lucky enough to work with the, with the Forest Service on their bear funding, uh, which is Burned Area Emergency Response Funding. And, uh, and they were awarded over $500,000, which is huge. That's gonna help get a lot of this ground covered. Um, and we're really excited about that. And so a portion of that 572 you'll see on the next slide will be used on the Sheep Mountain side. So yeah, $286,000 of, of bear funding uh, is gonna be allocated to this side of the, of the fire. Uh, in addition to that, we're currently seeking and have submitted applications to several other NGOs and, and other folks to, to help us pull this one off. Total project cost of $430,000. The Mule Deer Initiative request for Sheep Mountain is $50,000. Moving right along, Highway 487 Mule Deer Collision Reduction Project. So this is about 20 miles south of Casper. Uh, the goal here is to reduce deer vehicle collisions. This is a bad stretch for people hitting deer. Um, and it, it's been identified as, as such for for quite a while. We're talking about 10 miles in, in two stretches. You might be able to see that on this map. We've got, you know, two different sections highlighted there on, on Highway 487 uh, where we've, we've killed a lot of deer. And so working group identified it as an issue. Uh, YDOT, the department and our NGOs uh, really honed in on these sections as being the worst of the worst. And so this is an innovative approach. The, the idea here is to go in and, and chemically treat and or mechanically remove the shrubs that occur on the edge of the road. We're working with Whiteout to make that happen. Anybody that's traveled this section knows we've got some, some big sagebrush and greasewood and other shrubs in this, in this part that do two things um, that we're trying to mitigate against. Uh, they hide deer, they hide deer very well, and they provide a food source for deer. And so if we can uh, remove the visual of obstruction and so motorists traveling motorists can see those deer a little easier that's a good thing they're, then they have a, a better chance of not hitting them in addition to that if we remove the food source that brought them there in the first place that's the other goal and so uh, this one's a, a little bit of a of uh, a new approach for us but it has been highlighted several times uh, that as a as an innovative approach that may potentially be a, a low cost alternative to the need for overpasses, underpasses, and, and uh, associated fencing. And we don't know, you know if, how well it'll, it'll work in relation to those known things, but we do know it costs a heck of a lot less. And so um, that's, that's where we stand. We've got a couple different partners in on this one and $113,000 total cost, Mule Deer Initiative request of $31,000. Okay, UN a Mule Deer Survival Movement Habitat Use. So we're talking about an area east of Evanston here. 
Uh, we, this is an area that we haven't, uh, we don't have good fine scale movement data on this herd. Um, and we do know that these deer end up in places that they get bottlenecked up on, uh, including the Leroy Winter Range right along Interstate 80. And so I'll show you that here. You can see um, on the map on the right, we have deer that we think come from all of these places. So the Uinta Mountains and in uh, Utah and, and, and that straddle the Utah-Wyoming border. We think we have deer that come in from the west to this winter range complex. We know we likely have deer that come in uh, from the Wyoming range side. They all end up in this general area right along Interstate 80. And uh, we end up losing a lot of deer here as well to vehicle collisions um, and, and want to get a better handle on where they're coming from, where they're going, what those crossing points are. In addition to that, I think this is going to provide us some opportunities as it has in other places when we do these collaring studies um, to identify habitat areas to do habitat treatments on the ground as well. Uh, the goal here is to capture and monitor 60 adult female. We're going to install trail cameras at crossing structures and then we're going to use this data over time to inform uh, mule deer crossing locations along I-80 and other highways in that vicinity. We have YDOT funding uh, applied for Muley Fanatics and Mule Deer Foundation both have committed funding to this as well as the Knobloch Foundation. Uh, total project costs of $317,000, looking for $50,000 today from the commission. I'm going to keep rolling unless there's any other questions. Any questions? All right. Owl Creek Matitsi, cheatgrass control. So very similar to what we talked about up along the Grays River, we've got an area here where we've got an early uh, infestation of cheatgrass and uh, we were hoping to go in and, and target those areas and be able to, to knock that cheatgrass back before it spreads. It's actually spread out within this uh, corridor here and uh, this area occurs on um, uh, hunter management area and so we we feel pretty strongly this is a good spot to do some work. It'll have some good ecological benefits. Also, certainly uh, working with, with folks who, who have provided access. Um, the goal here is to use the new, the new product, Rejuvra, uh, and, and go in with helicopter and, and get these small areas taken care of where we still can before they get big on us. Uh, again, because it's early days on this one, uh, we haven't we haven't pulled together a ton of other funding, but we still feel it's really important to go in and, and be able to get this treated. RMEF has committed $10,000 with, with an additional 10,000, we'll be able to take care of that area. Moving right along, South Pass Aspen. This is in the Lander region, uh, about 25 miles south of Lander. Uh, the goal here, you guys have seen this one before, uh, improve Aspen regeneration and forest health. We're talking about 1,400 acres this time. This is part of a 10-year plan you can see here, maybe, the various polygons and the treatments and the areas that are either identified and or have already been taken care of. This is a great project and, and we're, we've got some great results on this one. Um, again, it might be a little hard to see, but you, you can clearly see there are, are significant conifers on, on this left-hand column and then um, quite a bit more Aspen, you can, I mean, it was there all along. It was just hard to see uh, after treatment. And so um, seeing really good results with, with these treatments. Uh, these, these habitats have declined over time. This is part of the 10-year plan. Uh, we're going to work on Forest Service and state lands as well as private lands this year. We've completed nearly 2,500 acres and, and just need more money to keep, keep moving. You can see here a list of partners who've, who've all contributed and, and are all a part of this, this current effort. Um, total project cost of 275, Mule Deer Initiative request of 75,000. It's Amy Anderson here who's been leading the charge all along and uh, has, has done a really good job on this one. As, as you guys know, WWNRT Partner of the Year, in fact. Sublet fence projects. Um, moving on to the sublet herd. So we've got two projects that we're working on here. Uh, eight and a half miles east of Boulder, and the other one is northwest of Daniel, where the goal here is to remove fences that are posing a threat to wildlife and replace them with ones that are that are wildlife friendly. We're talking about 17 uh, miles of fence. 
I want to call to your attention uh, this map here because I think it has a, a lot of overlap with, with a lot of other things. It's just it's exciting to be able to show this to you. So as you well know, this is the, the mule deer uh, corridor. And right here, one of the fences that we're working on. And right here is the other fence we're working on. And so we're, we really are targeting our efforts to get the best bang for the buck and to do the work in the areas that are likely to give us that best bang for the buck. And so that's the, that's the advantage of having caller data to inform future management actions. So there's a lot of fences in that country. We know we're doing the, be the best ones for wildlife by using that caller data. We've done a lot of fence modifications over the last decade uh, in, in Sublette County. Um, these ones occur in crucial winter year long habitats. Um, they're not wildlife friendly. Landowners in, in these both instances have committed to assisting with fence removal. Uh, they, they're going to do modifications throughout the year, including leaving gates open, et cetera, et cetera. We've, this is a this is a well thought out, well designed project with with good partners. Um, we did receive NIFWIF dollars. Uh, for, for those that may not know, that stands for National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, um, and then partners for fish and wildlife as well. And so we're excited about that. We're excited to be able to. To, uh, to bring in those federal funds, those outside funds to these projects and, and get them done on the ground. Uh, total project cost 348,000, MDI request of 80. If you look at the bottom picture, this is exactly what we're trying to prevent. We've got two deer, two separate deer hung up in that fence right there. And, and uh, I, we, we can do better. And, and with our partner's help, I think we will. Okay, Southern Bighorn Mountains, Curleaf Mountain Mahogany, Restoration 3. That indicates you've seen this at least two times before. This is a, a really good project as well. Uh, northwest of KC, our goal here is to preserve. We don't use that word a lot, but in this instance, it does apply. Uh, Curleaf Mountain Mahogany habitats. Uh, when when Curleaf Mountain Mahogany burns, it doesn't come back, at least not in our lifetime. And so we're trying to keep it on the landscape. The only reason it burns is because it gets conifers in it and the conifers carry the fire. So if we can keep that from happening, I think we'll, we'll be money ahead. Um, so 857 acres scheduled for treatment here. Um, this map on the left shows the past, present, and future treatments that we've done. Uh, the one on the right is specific to the treatment that we're talking about today on the EK Mountain. It's a big swath of land here, um, pretty important for deer. We're hoping to go in and tackle it all at once. And so that's that's why we're here today is, is to bring together the last bit of money to be able to do that. You can see, uh, we talk about that conifer encroachment and what that means. And in these pictures, you can see where that conifer gets in there and and, uh, and would carry fire and, and then just take out those stands. And so we're going in and removing them with chainsaws, laying it down, uh, making that uh, not an issue moving forward. We started this project and after the Outlaw Cave fire that occurred in 2011, uh, we lost hundreds of acres of, of early mountain mahogany, representing a, a major hit to this herd, realized at that time we needed to, we needed to be proactive in keeping those curly stands on, uh, on the landscape. And, and we've been, been hard at it ever since with, with help from partners. You can see here a uh, list of partners contributed funding to this. Um, total project cost of $607,000, a mule deer initiative request of $40,000 to the commission. Okay. Upper Powder River mule deer survival. Same country we were just talking about. Upper Powder River, west of KC. Um, the commission has seen this uh, this proposal before. This has been a, a long-standing study, or at least I think we're in year three of it now, um, where we've collared deer. We're now learning where they go, the sort of habitats they use. The map on the left is indicating uh, indicates um, these are all collar locations. And so the black, and what's showing up, I think is black on here, are individual deer and kind of their movements. And so um, the blue line would be on my right uh, is I-25. And so uh, we've, been, we've been studying these deer for a little while. We've learned quite a bit. Um, this, this population has been below population objective since 2000. Uh, we recapture the does every year in December. This is the final phase. This gets us over the hump. This is the money needed to, to finalize this project. Um, we're looking to examine uh, CWD testing methods uh, and do a final analysis with the help of Dr. Monty. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do here. 
We've got a lot of good partners on this one as well. Uh, total project cost of 334,000. The mule deer initiative request of $16,500 finishes the job. Moving back to uh, Sheep Mountain, Southeast Wyoming. This is uh, Terry Creek Ranch fence conversion. We're looking at three and a half miles of boundary and internal fences on Terry Creek Ranch, uh, total of 634 acres. What I'll point out here is, is how important this property is in relation to wintering deer. So this big peninsula, if you will, is Sheep Mountain. And many of you are familiar with Sheep Mountain and, and just how important that is to, to wintering wildlife. Um, this property lies in between Sheep Mountain and, and the rest of the forest that just burned. And, and so um, this really is important area for, for deer. And, and uh, we've got a variety of fences in here that are just not in very good shape that deer are using to cross back and forth on. Uh, the landowners are, are conservation minded. They're in the, in the process of putting this uh, under an easement. Um, this would help convert the fences as, as part of that. Uh, you can see maybe on these pictures um, here have some some difficulty navigating this. We've got some old uh, fences here, kind of in conjunction with some other fences, and, and all of that. The idea is all of that would go away, and, and we'd make this uh, wildlife friendly. Knobloch Foundation has contributed funding. Uh, the landowner has contributed funding. Uh, RMEF has already contributed funding. Total project costs seventy-five thousand. Mule Deer Initiative request of ten thousand dollars. All right. So we've talked about fourteen of sixteen projects today, and I'll give you a synopsis of the first fourteen, which fall under the the Mule Deer Initiative banner. Um, we talked about nine herds representing 35% of the statewide population. Uh, we've talked about over 2 million acres and uh, total project cost, if you add all of those together is three and a half million dollars. The request to date of the commission is $500,000. The leverage um, is six, essentially six to one. So for every commission dollar, uh, we have six dollars that came from, from the outside. And then if you break that down on a, on a very basic cost per acre, it's, it's pretty low. Um, so that is the, the Mule Deer Initiative presentation. I also have the Platte Valley Habitat Partnership presentation, which if, if there's questions on this, I'm happy to stop here and then go into that, or I can just keep going. Do you know the Okay, two more projects. Platte Valley Habitat Partnership projects. Um, as, as you may recall, uh, the commission set aside money uh, several years ago specific to Platte Valley Habitat Partnership to initiate projects in the Platte Valley. That was an allocation of $500,000. Uh, two or so years ago, we came before the commission and requested money. We did not last year um, and said, hey, we, We've got a great thing that's starting with the Forest Service called this Lava Project. I think once we get that under, underway, we'll have lots of project work. Well, that's, that, that has moved forward, there's no doubt. But since then, the Mullen Fire happened, and a lot of energy now is going to the Mullen Fire. And so um, we still have this pot of money set aside for mule deer within the Platte Valley. This is a project that will help address that. So Dana Meadows Fence, this is north of uh, Interstate 80. This is in the Platte Valley herd unit. Uh, this occurs four miles south of Hanna. The goal here is to remove and replace over 10 miles of fence and install pipelines and water tanks, uh, which will help provide proper grazing deferment post wildfire. We're talking about a uh, wildfire that was about 14,000 acres. This picture on the bottom, I actually took that picture. I was there uh, north of Hanna on that early September day and, and watched that thing go from a very small puff of smoke to a very large uh, fire in, in a matter of hours. Um, you can see the town of Hannah here. This is, this is the wildfire perimeter. Um, we have fences and, and pipelines within here that, that uh, we're hoping to address with this project. Um, Landowner and grazing leasee will partner with the game fish, and we're, the goal here again is to replace pipelines and the water tanks. Um, we did receive, I just got word on this earlier, 
the secretarial secretarial order funding uh, for sixty three thousand dollars that that was approved. Um, we certainly have a good relationship with the with the uh, landowner as well as as the permittee, um, and they've committed funding to this effort as well. Total project cost of nearly one hundred fifty thousand. Uh, the request to Platte Valley Habitat Partnership is $13,000. Very last project that I that I want to talk to you today about is the Mullen Wildfire Cheatgrass Control. Now, again, we talked about this one earlier. This one occurs on the Platte Valley side, so 176,000 acre fire. Uh, within the Platte Valley side, we've got 7,700 acres that we need to treat from a cheatgrass perspective. This map on the left shows the, the various severities that occur within that fire perimeter. So red means more severe, green means less severe. Um, we're using that to help inform where we're gonna go. And in fact, back to your earlier point about using imagery, um, we're partnering with CSU on this one uh, to help uh, inform management and, and where we wanna go with, with uh, being very focused around those areas that are most likely to have cheatgrass and, and are known cheatgrass areas. And so, again, that, that's the value of using that sort of cutting edge technology is we're not spraying 176,000 acres. In this instance, on this side, we're spraying 7,000. And so that's a, that's a huge cost savings. Um, high likelihood that, that we know we have cheatgrass here um, and in, in certain areas and, and we want to get ahead of it. Again, we're leveraging these bear funds that came from the Forest Service. Uh, we've got a total of five hundred thousand uh, dollars to do this side of the of the burn, and uh, we're looking for some some big help over here uh, with a hundred thousand dollar request to the Platte Valley Habitat Partnership. Um, leverage that against uh, a variety of, of really good partners, uh, NIFWIF and, and others who are all contributing. I'll go to the conclusion for Platte Valley. So we're talking about nearly twenty two thousand acres. Uh, Total cost of over six hundred thousand dollars, one hundred thirteen thousand dollars of, of uh, commission dollars. Um, yeah, that's that's that is those two projects within the Platte Valley herd, and I will be glad to stand for questions. Yeah. Hey, Mr. President, I did want to take this opportunity to talk about a few things. So, first of all, this culmination of work that you've seen here today from Ian. Um, I think is is very reflective of the vision and the foresight that the commission had five and a half years ago when they saw fit with some risk and I, I know with some um, a little bit of concern and some question but the commission did something they hadn't done before and that was to allocate future funds um, and commit those funds for work specifically on the mule deer initiative and what that did is it provided the department a lot of flexibility to go out and find all of the, the cool stuff that you guys have seen here. When this started, I think we, the first year we might have had five or six projects. Today you just saw 14 from the Mule Deer Initiative alone. And so I really want to highlight that and, and thank, you know, there's two commissioners here today that were a part of that, Commissioner Ryle and Commissioner Crank. And um, it, it warms my heart to see where we've come with this thing. This is a, that's a tremendous amount of work across the entire state on mule deer habitat work. And um, the, the other thing I wanted the, the commission to know is, is that obviously there's a lot of proposals and a lot of vetting that is done before you ever see this. So we almost have like a mini WWNRT um, board evaluation within the department. We bring in external um, help for that to evaluate all these projects, prioritize the most important and decide which ones um, the department's going to recommend to the commission for funding. And uh, it's a, good, a great piece of work, and I um, applaud Ian and the team for putting this together. Mr. President, Mr. Brian um, or Ian, correct me if I'm wrong. We've already obligated all these funds, and now the department's coming back saying, out of this pot of money you dedicated to the Mule Deer Initiative or to the Platte Valley Partnership, um, we want to spend those funds that the commission has prior, previously authorized in these ways. Is that is that accurate? Mr. President, Commissioner Crank, that is correct. And so when we first started this, we um, the, the commission wanted to see all these projects and rightly so. And so um, they, 
the, the, the way that that went down uh, was 500,000 a year for five years would be available for worthy projects. And so we're bringing projects forward for your consideration and approval. Thank you. Uh, we have a public comment. I'm Sean from Mule Deer Foundation. Is he ready for us? Yeah, President Duby, Director Nesbitt, Commissioners, thanks for letting me comment. I just was going to say I appreciate all your guys' hard work on all this Mule Deer Foundation initiative stuff, or the Mule Deer Initiative stuff and the Platte Valley stuff. Um, it's really a lot of great work, and we appreciate all of it. I just wanted to update you guys that we are hiring a full-time biologist down in the Platte Valley to assist, and that'll be a lot involved with the uh, lava implementation or that medicine bow landscape vegetation analysis project implementation that will probably now convert a lot into post fire remediation but we will have a full-time position down there and i just wanted to make sure you guys knew that so we look forward to working with you guys and especially with Britt brito down there since i guess we just you guys just hired a new biologist so i just wanted to tell you guys that and thank you very much for all your help thank you sean for your your uh organization's involvement and continued involvement in all these projects. Thank you. Any other comments? Ian? Chair would entertain a motion. I would move that we authorize these projects as outlined by Ian in his presentation. I'll second that. Moved by Commissioner Crank, seconded by Commissioner Brokaw to accept the department's recommendations both for MDI and Platte Valley. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. You're in favor, right? Yeah, I was on that side of the <laughs> All right. They're all in favor. All right. Thank you very much, Ian. President, Appreciate it. Um, can I get a more detailed map of the Cumberland Project and the Craze River Project? Of Mr. President, uh, Commissioner Roberts, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Just, just so I can kind of put it in my head a little bit more. Right. Sure thing. We'll get that to you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate everything, guys. We'll go uh, the next item, then we'll take a break. So, Angie. President, I'll introduce the next presenter. Jill Randall is the Big Game Migration Corridor for the Wildlife Division, and she will be giving informational presentation on the I-25 KC to Buffalo Wildlife Crossing Project. Good afternoon, um, commissioners, President Duby, uh, rest of the commission, and Director Nesvik. Thank you for having me here today to talk about the I-25 Wildlife Crossing Project near KC. Um, Megan, next slide, please. Uh, just as a reminder, this is one of the projects that uh, I talked to you about in July, and it is the highway crossing project right outside of KC where we're working with our Sheridan region and YDOT to come up with a solution along the right-of-way fencing for this uh, stretch of highway. The mule deer mortalities that have been experienced here are the uh, second most deadly in the state. And so we're really trying to target this area, um, particularly in the fall and late summer season when deer are walking across the, the right-of-way is when we're having the most problems in this area. Next. Um, the solutions we talked to you about before are including um, eight foot tall wildlife exclusionary fence um, along the highway to funnel deer into those existing underpasses. We're hoping this is a more wild or it's more fiscally <laughs> friendly way to um, accomplish the same goals as some of the other more expensive projects where we're actually building underpasses. We're, we're trying to use the structures that are currently in place to accomplish those goals. Next. So the progress we've made since July, I just wanted to update you on that. Um, our regional folks and YDOT have had a kickoff meeting to officially start the planning of this um, project and really try to drill down into the on the ground best solutions for um, this particular project. You can see here three of the existing underpasses that um, we'll be directing the fencing right towards so that the deer are able to use these. As you recall, we have a camera study 
that has occurred in this area. And these underpasses here were several of the ones that were incorporated into that study where we documented the use prior to any work um, of these underpasses. And we were excited to see that the deer are already using them. And so we're very encouraged that the solution of modifying the right-of-way fence uh, will be highly successful. Part of that planning process um, included the, the next slide, which is an updated map. Uh, if you could move forward, please. So this is a new map, probably to most of you to see this. We just kind of finished developing this and there's a lot of great things I wanna point out on here. So all the black dots, those are mile posts. The green crosses um, marks here are the existing underpasses and the heat map, so the red color, those are the hot spots for collisions and wildlife mortality. So the existing project um, is intending to take in all three of those red hot spots that you see there. And we're really working to try to fi uh, finalize the recommendation on the north end of this project. There's been some discussion of whether we should go up to that around milepost 270 to incorporate that um, lighter color that you see there, which is an additional hot spot of mortality, or if we need to kind of bring it back closer to 265. Our field folks on the ground are working with YDOT to kind of finalize some of those components, utilizing the data that we have available. When I talked to you in July, we were looking at a slightly different stretch um, of this highway. It did not include the area south of milepost 255. But by looking at the data that we had available to us with the um, carcass counts and the collision data, we were able to see a hot spot right there at the KC interchange. That was a really critical area to include in this project. And so now the plan is to incorporate that hot spot into the fencing project. Um, that inclusion resulted in potentially extending the fence to additional miles. Um, that that's kind of, like I said, the, the work that we're looking at now is, is whether we need to pull back the north end um, or if we still leave it where we had it before up around 270. Next slide, please. So the cost estimate that I brought you in July was between two and 2.5 million. And since then, we've been able to get um, a better picture of, like I said, the mileage that would be involved as well as improved estimates from YDOT on the cost per mile for fencing. Based on recent bids that YDOT has got, they adjusted the, um, the cost probably to a more realistic number for today's expenses. And um, I also wanna point out that YDOT does just kind of generally plan for about a 5% annual increase in construction costs, um, just based on inflation and the, the world that we live in. Next slide, please. Our current funding that we have in place, um, based on the 750,000 that the commission allocated uh, previously to this project, we've been able to leverage that and get a lot of matching funds. As you see here, WWNRT brought significant matching funds to the project. The Knobloch Family Foundation and Williams Energy both uh, contributed through the Wildlife Fund, and the Wildlife Fund has also brought some funding to the table. We have about one, excuse me, 1.7 million that has been committed, and um, I think it's important to note that we've also got a great in-kind commitment from Johnson County, and the landowners that are adjacent to this project um, really need to be um, appreciated as well. Although they're not bringing funding to the table, their cooperation is, is really essential to making sure that the movement can occur in the existing underpasses between um, private properties on both sides of the fence or both sides of the highway. Next slide, please. Uh, we have, of course, a lot of work still ahead of us. Um, our field folks really are, are working hard with YDOT to try to solidify those endpoints where we're gonna end the fence, um, the total mileage of the project. And there's a lot of details that need worked out, like 
where to put the jumps and the gates and the specific specifications of the fence. Um, those are all kind of those details that need to be specifically agreed upon for each of these projects. Um, public meetings are going to be coming up still. WIDA and Game and Fish will hold those jointly um, or will cooperate on them. And then of course, additional fundraising. So there's, there's uh, as you can see, still funding gap in um, what we need to accomplish the project. And we're working with the Wildlife Fund to come up with some you know, creative funding solutions to try to close that gap. Um, that's really the, one of the biggest lifts that we still have to do um, in the coming months in order to ensure we can get this to the implementation phase. Next slide, I think I am done. Yep, and so with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Any questions for Jill or Andy, Angie? Uh, Jill or Angie, I have a question regarding, and when we, we proposed this a while back, we were, we also, we challenged people to help contribute and we've kind of maxed that out, it appears. And we also talked about how this would be a great project to get people uh, other walks of life. We have a, a ton of NGOs that help us on a lots of different projects. Um, just plenty, we just saw it with MDI and others. Do we have any plans of trying to reach out to maybe some more non-traditional type of folks, maybe who aren't um, like the Elk Foundation or whatever, uh, other corporations or other things to try to, to get money to, to go with this thing. And maybe some uh, organizations that are, um, I'm just going to throw it out there. So like maybe Wyoming Untrapped or, or some of these other non-traditional type organizations that don't um, tend to help us out financially with some of these projects. Whereas this is one we could all get behind. So I'm just curious where we're going with that. Um, thank you for that question, President Duby. And Jill, I'll jump in here if you're okay. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I think we're kind of at a crossroads here. We, like she said, we're at 1.8, but we got a little bit more to go. And so just a couple other maybe possibilities, um, and then I'll get more to your question, um, Mr. President. But first of all, um, you guys are aware of the governor's challenge for um, 2020 license plate by the end of the year. Well, we made it, we're at 2,040 license plates. And doing some checking this morning, that account that sits over at YDOT, our partners with this, is at just under 400,000 brought in from those license plates. In addition, they have another $100,000 in that account from different donations. So right about a half a million. I think um, we need to further the conversation with YDOT to see if that's a possibility of using those funds for this project. And then a very interesting um, development that I um, had Jennifer run some numbers this morning. So if you guys remember, there was the enrolled legislation last year um, that added different opportunities for our constituents and other folks to donate to this fund. Um, one of those was when they go in to buy a license or a, a draw application um, with the department, they could just randomly donate um, to this license plates fund. And in seven months, I'm pleasantly surprised to announce that that account, that account has over $40,000 in it. Um, and just break that down a little bit, in seven months, we had 10,058 separate donations. All of those were under $100. Most of those were under $10 a piece. Um, but I, I really wanna just take a moment to reflect on that because I think it really says that our constituents um, and Wyomingites are very interested in this project and wildlife crossings in general. Um, so with that said, I think those are a couple accounts that we can draw on. But you're right, President Duby, that still won't quite be enough. Um, and even though we're extremely appreciated of, of those partners, especially the Wildlife Fund, who have gone out of their way to help contribute to this project, I'm sort of thinking we're, we're kind of at a roadblock here. Um, and I, I think we need to be more creative and look at those maybe non-traditional funders that have always funded things for the department in the past, but do a farther reach. Um, maybe there's private industry that would be interested in doing donations, as well as other um, nonprofit groups that maybe, you know, haven't contributed to the department in the past, but would be interested. Well, I think it's a great idea, and if we don't ask, we won't get. 
So, it, you know, we're all trying to, to, to get after the same dollars. And, and I realize that this project is not finalized as far as the actual cost of it. So uh, we don't want to promise something we can't can't do. So I know that's still a work in progress. And I know you guys will be working on that. But I think it's a good idea trying to trying to find as many additional sources as we possibly can, try to get more people involved. Hey, thank you very much. All right, let's take a break and we'll get back here at three. Commission President Duby, Commissioners Director Nesnik. I think Director Nesnik might want to start out this agenda, if I'm correct, on speed grounds. All right. So, yeah, some of them haven't heard that before, but <laughs> that's what we affectionately call him when we're not in the commission meeting. <laughs> so anyway, I just, I wanted to start this off with, with um, a thank you to the folks that have put a whole lot of hard work into what I oftentimes frame as one of the most complex wildlife management challenges in, in North America. And I really believe that. I believe it's the perfect, it's the perfect wicked problem where you have multiple agencies, state and federal, um, you have two different competing diseases, you have two or three different um, industries that are economic drivers in our state involved, and a whole lot of passionate people that really care a lot about elk. And, you know, we, we um, have certainly, this isn't the first time that, that people have been concerned about feed grounds and disease, but, you know, it was coming to a point with um, public interest, with federal land management decisions, with litigation, that the department really needed to take a leadership role and step out and, and at least do a couple of things. And firstly, we felt like the, there were significant information gaps amongst all the folks that were interested. Certainly those folks that were interested in it from, for, let's just say from a hunting perspective, you know, they, they learned um, enough about it to know about the hunting component of the problem. Those folks from the federal land management agencies that were interested in it for public policy making, you know, they looked at it through that lens. And I really felt like, you know, the department had the best grasp of all angles and all of the, um, the pertinent information that built the problem. And we were best to go out and try to, to make sure people at least were informed so that they can understand why the commission and the department have made the decisions that we've made over the last several years and to help us um, when we make decisions in the future on feed grounds. And so, you know, we, one of the things that, that I know was a concern right off the bat was the public wondered if this was a plan by the commission to um, start shutting down feed grounds. We made it very, very clear in the beginning of the meetings that Scott's going to talk about today that this was not a plan to shut down feed grounds, but rather an opportunity to provide information and to look at a long-term feed ground management plan. And, and I say long-term, and what I mean by long-term is, you know, not two years, but, but several years down the road. You know, we've been talking about, I think, around 10 years down the road, what, what we're looking at for managing feed grounds. So with kind of that backdrop and that background, um, these folks did an amazing job of, of going out and fulfilling the first phase of this. And um, Deputy Chief Speedberg will have uh, a summary of that right now. Thank you. Thank you, Director, for that, that lead in. And, and um, I just want to say, yeah, the team that I worked with, and they did all the work, um, and both internally and externally, our federal partners were key in, in what we've done so far with phase one and, and uh, what phase two will look like. And so I'm just going to kind of go over what we've done, where we're at, and where we're going. And so as, as Director Nesvik said, this, uh, this is what we're going to call um, elk feed grounds, a challenge we can take on. That's what we've titled this, and that's what, how we're going to move it forward. And this process we're in, this phase one, is basically an outcome of the CWD management plan and includes past, current, and future issues pertaining to feed grounds. And as, as Director Nesvik said, our goal is to end up with a long-term management plan for our 22 uh, elk feed grounds. So a committee was formed um, late spring of, of 2020, 
and included representatives from the department, as I said, and representatives from our federal partners from the National Elk Refuge, the U.S. Forest Service, the BLM, and Grand Teton National Park. And we've been working together since early summer of 2020 to get this thing kicked off. Um, this will be a multi-phase uh, facil multi facilitated process. Um, and we wouldn't be where we are today if I didn't say a big thanks to Tara Kuyper from Kuyper's, uh, Tara Kuyper's Consulting. She's actually been a key individual in this entire process. And she heard this group of cats internally and externally pretty darn well. And without her, um, we wouldn't be where we, where we are today. So um, as I've said, this is gonna be a multi-phase process. Um, we're wrapping up phase one. We'll be bringing some information on phase two during the next couple months, which we think this phase two will take probably an additional 12 to 18 months um, uh, to get that uh, long-term feed, long-term feed ground plan kind of penciled out what it looks like. It may even take, take longer. Um, we just don't really know. But this phase one basically is gonna start out with a, a bunch of public meetings to engage the publics on, on a couple different things. Share information related to feed ground history, objectives of the program and the complexities that have evolved over time related to continuing feeding operations and two, secure public and stakeholder feedback that will lead to the development of the future strategy and policy for the feed ground program and set the conditions for phase two. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we had this master plan of, of going to six different locations in Wyoming, um, or in Western Wyoming, and then Casper and Cheyenne. But this wonderful thing called COVID came along, shut down our in-person meetings. And so we made the decision that we're gonna take this on the virtual circuit, and which we did. Um, we held four virtual public meetings uh, between the 1st of December and the 3rd of December. Uh, each meeting was allowed 90 attendees. So we would have had a maximum of 360 total attendees uh, overall. And of that 360 over those four meetings, uh, we had a total of 107 attendees. Each meeting was set for three hours at a set agenda and was co-hosted by myself and, and Tara Kuypers. We had three set presentations that we did at each one. Feed Grounds History and Operations, presented by Pinedale Region Wildlife Super John, Supervisor John Lund. Feed Ground Disease Overview, presented by Wildlife Health Lab, uh, Supervisor Hank Edwards and Pinedale Wildlife Management Coordinator Brandon Skirlock. And then more specifically, a presentation again by Brandon Skirlock on, on bursillosis and feed grounds. And then those were followed up by presentations by our federal partners. Uh, one from the National Elk Refuge, done by Frank Durbian, who is the refuge manager, and Eric Cole, the refuge biologist. Uh, Jim Wilder from the U.S. Forest Service, Bridger Teton National Forest. Uh, Mark Thonoff from the BLM and National Park Service, Grand Teton National Park, Gus Smith. Each of those federal partners play a role in our feed ground operations or the management of elk that involves feed ground. Each presentation was, was followed by a Q and A, ses by a Q &A uh, session that was, had a lot of great questions. Some of the key questions that we, we saw repeatedly, what are the historical earliest rec recorded elk populations area? Where would have elk wintered historically? How do surrounding states deal with these issues or are feed grounds unique to Wyoming? Does the cost of feed grounds provided include the cost of damage paid to the department? Is there connectivity between winter ranges and do elk linger near feed grounds during the summer? Regarding diseases, is the issue of elk commingling with cattle only important during elk calving? Should hunters be concerned with contracting disease from harvested elk? How long can elk potentially live in infected with CWD? you feel there will be more death loss from disease or from starvation from discontinuing feeding programs? Some of the questions for our federal partners. Federal feeding program supported by a state license sales or federal appropriation. Does the National Park Service test for wildlife disease in the park? Are there additional areas of the forest and BLM that could be considered for winter range protections to expand wintering habitat for elk and reduce the need for supplemental feeding? Does the National Elk Refuge employ low density feeding. Do they have enough room for low density feeding? And then there was just some general overall questions. How much would elk population decline if winter feeding was discontinued? And how do wolves influence elk use on native winter range? And then what type of competition would there be if elk were to move on to deer, moose, and other winter ranges for those individual species? So upon each uh, virtual session, which basically took the entire three hours, 
participants, well, we collected participants' email address. They were emailed back a online comment form and also information on how to take a survey monkey uh, survey on some issues that we brought up during the, um, during the uh, information sessions. And people could also mail comments back to the department between December 1st and January 8th, January 8th of 2021. So what, what did we ask the, the folks through the survey monkey? And as Brian said, or Director Nesdick said, we're just trying to reach out to get an idea of what they know about information, share information about the grounds. But our, one of our goals of this phase one process is what do we do in phase two when we actually get in the meat potatoes of, of developing this long-term management plan? So we ask these questions. Does this pre presentation provide you with new information? What additional information pertaining to elk feed grounds do you need? What role do you believe elk feed grounds play in Wyoming today? What role do you believe elk feed grounds play in Wyoming in the future? What ideas or suggestions do you have as we begin to plan phase two? And then please rank the following topics according to your priorities. Wildlife disease, which all these are a low, medium, high rating. Impacts on agriculture. Economic impacts are the three that we ask them to follow up on. In addition to the online or the in-person online um, webinars uh, information sessions, we recorded the very first one. We posted that online on Monday, December 7th. And as of the time I'm reporting to you, we had uh, 469 views on that, with the average time being 26 minutes and 65 viewers watching the whole recording. So. That's not bad for a three hour video that people sat down and watched to educate themselves on, on feed grounds. And additionally, in response to that recorded webinar we placed on the website, we held a Q&A session on January 5th at four o'clock. And that was so those people that watched the recorded uh, video had a chance to ask the same questions or, or, or get information, um, just like those folks that actually attended the in-person session. And so again, that session was leaded, uh, limited to 90 folks. We had 23 individuals attend. That lasted a full 90 minutes. And we had a lot of great questions. And again, that Q&A session was also posted on the department website um, for others to view. Some stats on that one. Uh, we had uh, 15, 15 people view that uh, since it's been posted and three folks watched that entire in its entirety. So where are we at now with the public input? Well, we're still in the process of finalizing that. We have our phase one draft report developed. Um, it's in our internal committee reviewing phase and um, that should be done hopefully here in the next week to 10 days. And then at that point, I will get with uh, the director's office, Chief King, uh, present that to them for their review. That will also include a recommendation for phase two and then um, We'll take that plan or any revisions back from that meeting to the committee and um, get that cleaned up. And then the plan is to bring the, the phase one results back to the commission in March with our phase two recommendation and then hit the ground um, running in early spring or uh, late spring, early summer of, of this year into phase two. Um, and uh, that's probably going to be a that's going to be the meat and potatoes. There'll be a lot of involvement in that one. We're really looking forward to that. Um, we had a lot of media statewide and regional communications on. I want to say thanks to Sarah and Rebecca for their work on that. Without that, we wouldn't get the we wouldn't have gotten the uh, promotion of this effort um, without them. Everything from press releases, media interviews, correspondence, direct emails, hunting updates, social media, and we have a, a developed speed ground webpage where all this information is is uh, stored. So a big, big thanks to them for their efforts working with this committee to, to get this publicized and, and get that announced. So that's kind of a quick and dirty of, of where what we did, where we're at, and where we're going. Again, we really look forward to starting on phase two here late spring, early summer of 2021. And, and like I said, we will bring a more in-depth, complete report with all the comments summarized and additional data here. Um, our plan is at the, at the March Commission. So with that, um, Take any questions, or, or the commissioners have, or Brian has anything else to add to, to what what uh, I provided. I participated in one of those, and I thought you guys did an outstanding job. Appreciate the efforts of the department and personnel that helped with it. It was very educational. It was good. Any questions for? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Sure. 
do pescar. Good afternoon, President Duby, Commissioners, Director Nesvik. So today um, I wanted to uh, talk about the uh, Flaming Gorge Reciprocity Stamp. And uh, for those of you that have been on the commission for a while, you might remember we uh, talked about this back in 2017. Um, and uh, the reason we're talking about it again today is a request that was made by the Utah Wildlife Board, which is basically the, their commission that provides oversight to the U Utah Division of Wildlife. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, to figure this out. There you go. So I wanted to review a little bit about um, what the reciprocity program is and um, what it provides to our, our uh, resident anglers. So 231801 uh, provides authorization for us to enter into reciprocal agreements with other states that have where there's impoundments or reservoirs that straddle state lines. We have three of those in the state. We have the Gorge, we have Palisades Reservoir, and we have Bighorn Lake. The only reservoirs that we have or impoundments that we have a reciprocity agreement with is on the Gorge with Utah. So 23-1801, um, basically what the, the reciprocity agreement does is it gives, allows the um, commission to uh, enter an agreement with another state and have a reciprocal stamp that uh, is at a reduced price, in this case, um, as a benefit to the publics of both states. So um, a, a person, a resident angler from Wyoming could go to Utah, purchase a reciprocal stamp in Utah um, at a reduced rate, and then I'll get a little bit into the rates here in a minute, um, rather than buy a full yearly non-resident license. So it's a benefit that is provided through the statute to the residents of both states. In 231801, um, I'll go back, and it, it specifies, I want you uh, to remember, it specifies residents of Wyoming and residents of Utah in this case, not non-residents. So 231801 uh, says that the commission is authorized to establish orders as provided in this act. So we do have a commission policy that allows uh, that uh, uh, commission delegates authority to enter into these agreements to the department. So back in 2017, the commission directed uh, the department to revisit uh, the current agreement we had with Utah. Um, so in late 2017, um, we started to do that. So a little history of the stamp, uh, right after the fishery was established in the gorge after uh, the reservoir was built, about 1964, we entered into agreement with, with Utah. So it's been there for a long time. Um, at that time, I believe it was around $2. In 1973, it was modified again to about $3. Uh, again, in 1986, it went to about 5 I believe, and then modified again in 1995 to $10. So from 1995 until um, the new... Um, agreement went into place in 2019, it was at $10. Pretty good deal for a person to be able to go um, to Utah to fish and for Utah residents come to Wyoming to fish. However, we felt that there are production costs and management costs associated with the reservoir, so inflation, concerning that, um, we went into the agreement with Utah to try to raise that rate, which we did uh, we raised it to $30 in Wyoming. Uh, Utah chose to keep it at $10. Um, and I checked the regulations here uh, this week and uh, uh, they jump it to $12 this year. 
So how we came up with $30, uh, we looked at how much a license costs in Utah for a resident, how much a license costs in Wyoming for a resident, and how much the difference would be uh, from those license costs and the stamp. So we came up with $30 um, using this, this chart here um, as, as a uh, proposal, which the commission uh, ratified in July of 2018, and then it, it was implemented in 2019. So what the current agreement does is it, um, it provides the privilege for Utah and Wyoming anglers to fish the whole reservoir if they purchase a stamp. So if a Wyoming resident has a resident Wyoming license, they can purchase a stamp and then go fish uh, Utah side of the waters. And vice versa, if a Utah angler has a resident Utah <coughs> license, they can purchase a Wyoming stamp and fish the Wyoming sides of the water, rather than purchase a full non-resident uh, fishing license. In, in Wyoming's case, it's $114 plus a stamp. They could purchase a one day or a five days license as well, or they could get the stamp for $30. It, uh, the agreement has language addressing regulation compliance and possession limits, i.e. if you're fishing in Utah, you have to obey their limits and regulations. And if you're fishing Wyoming waters, you have to obey our um, regulations and um, possession limits. So we do, this part of this agreement also directs us to work cooperatively with Utah, uh, trying to get reg regulation, similar regulations in place and uh, to, uh, we have a plan, a management plan for the reservoir. We meet every year and we, we, we try to manage that reservoir co cooperatively with Utah. That being said, the reservoir is basically broken into three segments. You have the inflow region, the open hills region in the middle, and then the canyon region down in Utah. Um, so, you know, um, it's not apples and apples a lot of times. Um, because uh, in, in our minds, of course, the fishing is better in, in Wyoming. So, and and uh, it is the more productive part of the reservoir. So to have regulations and possession limits and everything that are always the same, it's not going to happen. Uh, but we we strive. We have a really good relationship with work with Utah, trying to get those regulations uh, that are initially the same for the sportsmen, uh, for the anglers. Uh, simplicity. Uh, agreement can, may be modified, which we have done, and it may be terminated, providing 90 days. So we don't have to have this. Agreement. So some of the fiscal information that we've I've got for you is that prior to 2018 agreement, <coughs> our five-year average of stamp sales was about 86.25, and we were making an average about $86,000. Utah, conversely, was selling about 1,625 license, uh, uh, stamps a year. It was making about $16,000. Um, under a new fee, fee schedule, which was implemented in 2019, uh, we sold about 6727 uh, So there was a reduction, which you usually have when you have an increase. But we bumped up our, our income to 173420 Last year, um, 2020, um, we, we made 203610 So a pretty substantial amount of money that we can direct back into management of the reservoir and fisheries. So the Utah Wildlife Board's request is basically um, that Wyoming would not charge Utah anglers to fish in Wyoming if in possession of a valid Utah fishing license. And conversely, Utah would not charge Wyoming anglers to fish in Utah if they're in possession of a valid Wyoming fishing license. They have similar agreements on Lake Powell and on Bear Lake. They, kind of, they term it a good neighbor agreement. So you could go, if I had a, a, a I have a fishing license on Fishing Gorge, I could go anywhere on the gorge without having a, a license. And um, they gave us two options. Um, to look at. One was just that, and the other one was to include non-residents into that mix, which um, would be in contrary to our statute. 
So, um, with that, we, we did have a meeting with them and uh, uh, President Duby, Commissioner Brokaw, um, Director Nesbitt, myself, and um, did I say President Duby? Yeah. Someone else, maybe. But anyway, um, they gave us their their uh, thoughts on it, and uh, um, Commissioner Dooley wanted the presentation today um, on the agreement. So, with that, I'll entertain any questions you might have about the, the agreement or the, the stamp or the process or management on the board. Commissioner Brokaw and I were a part of that meeting, and we decided we did not have the authority to change that agreement that was up to the commission as a whole so we wanted to bring it to all of you to, to, to discuss and think about it what about the uh, one of the rationale that they had for this is management of lake trout uh, and the pup trout do you have any comments on that I do you or know, maybe um, a little background on what we're talking about so president Duby, commissioners uh, director Neswick so on our end of the reservoir, we've been seeing an uptick on um, lake trout less than 27 um, inches. And um, above that, they consider trophy, below that uh, term pups. And um, with that increase, the concern is there's, you know, we manage it as a trophy lake trout fishery, and it has been that way, and it's been an outstanding one for a lot of years. And our concern is that there's not enough groceries to go around. And if we allow that younger age class um, lake trout segment to increase too much, it might impact the trophy lake trout fishery there. So we've increased the limits in, in, in collaboration with Utah um, and possession limit there. So you can take 12 daily and have possession 24 and the region, Green River region, has done an outstanding job of promoting that uh, for folks to keep those smaller lake trout and uh, as to help our management. And we feel that it's been pretty effective so far. Uh, as you can see by the stamp sales, we have a lot of folks, much more coming from Utah than our folks coming from Utah to Wyoming than our folks going to Utah to fish, and there's a reason for that. Um, but we feel that right now we have the anglers out there that we need to uh, potentially impact that that uh, segment of the population. Uh, we're not necessarily looking for it anymore. Um, their their feeling is is that if we lower the price of our stamp, that'll encourage more Utah anglers to come to Wyoming and harvest more of the smaller lake trout that's essentially their that's the basis of their justification for why this is a good idea that's one of them the other one is from a, a, a angler simplicity standpoint you know they don't have to do anything to fish the whole reservoir but i you know we maintain that we have uh, management objectives and we have costs associated with uh, um, managing that fishery on our side uh, whether it's production of uh, hatchery raised fish that we put in there um, or just purely management um, and two hundred three thousand dollars is is pretty good chunk chain do you have any comments after i would just add <clears throat> president Bibi, that in our discussions earlier on that phone call i can't remember the number now but uh utah had an estimated increase in anglers that would come to wyoming if we if we didn't charge for a stamp and i can't remember what that was but that was um the argument was well that's more money coming and being spent in your gas stations and your food stores and while that's correct that's good for the state but for the department that was additional wear and tear on boat ramps <coughs> camping facilities um, outhouses that kind of thing so um i i just wanted to point out that conversation and, and reiterate what alan said there's a lot of costs that our department people put into management of the lake just besides the raising of the fish. So 
I think two hundred and three thousand dollars is a significant amount of money um, that we that we shouldn't let go of. Yeah, and I, th I think also the that our Wyoming anglers and other non-residents that, that fish in that reservoir, if, if we were to change that, we could have quite an influx of increase in fishermen in the gorge, and it may lessen their experience overall, and also put uh, substantial. Uh, impact on all the infrastructure as well. Correct. I would just assume they raised it to thirty dollars on their side. But anyway. Mr. President. Commissioner Crank. So this is a thirty dollar annual fee. Uh, President Doobie, uh, Commissioner Crank, that's correct. I guess my thought is that seems like a rational, reasonable fee to come fish a lake like the Flaming Gorge, which is an amazing fishery. And I, you know, if they want to raise their fee, that's their decision. But I don't see any good reason to lower our fee. We, we studied it hard and we decided that was an appropriate fee. And it appears to me to still be an appropriate fee. Any more discussion on that? Mr. President, um, I have a, a question. How do they, when, when they do the reciprocal and uh, how do they do the enforcement and the jurisdiction? So if you were to allow if Utah was to allow it to come on Wyoming without a reciprocal stamp, how would the jurisdiction lie? Because aren't you swearing an oath that you're with Utah, but you're not, if you come into Wyoming, how would how would a violation occur? What would, what would be the premise for our game warden to say, you've caught too much fit, too many fish, but you have a Utah license, but is, do we, would we have the jurisdiction on that Utah license? President Doomby, uh, Commissioner Roberts. So, it, yeah, right now the agreement says that if you're, you know, you can fish Wyoming if you purchase a stamp, as long as you got your re resident Utah. But when you come into Wyoming, you have to pay by our regulations and our rules, and vice versa for folks going down there. So, if we entered into this agreement that they're suggesting, we'd have to have verbiage that was um, consistent with that again. Yeah, and to be to be clear, there are proposals not for us to eliminate the stamp necessarily. I think they're they're more interested in us just lowering the cost from thirty to ten, but anglers would still be required to have the stamp, correct? No, I think that their their proposal is like just like, no stamp. Like they have in, in on Lake Powell and on Bear Lake. But they still have agreements and we would still have an agreement with them that would allow them to do that. We'd have to have verbiage in there that says that they'd have to still obey the Wyoming regulations and possession limits when fishing in Wyoming and vice versa. We currently have two other bodies of water, the Bighorn and what you say, Palisades? Palisades. That we have no agreement whatsoever. If you're on our side, you have to have a Wyoming license. If you're on the other side, you have to have a Montana or, or Idaho license. Correct? That's correct, President Drew. Is there any discussion, any more questions? I mean, I, I, I don't know if we actually need a motion to, to, to just decided not to entertain. Is that correct? I guess, is there a general consensus? I think so. To leave it the way it is. So I think that's what we'll do. Thank you, Commission. President Duty. Thank you. All right, so we're going to wrap up our day by recognizing two outstanding individuals that this will be their Commissioner Ryan, Commissioner Frank's last meeting. And so we've we've got to, I'm gonna represent the department and we've got some things to say and some presentations. And then I know there's members of the public, um, at least two organizations anyway, is that where we're still at, John? Two organizations that also wanna to talk to the commission um, about these two gentlemen to make some presentations virtually. And then I think Mr. President, the plan is, is just a general um, call to the public following that. And that'll wrap up the meeting for the day.
All right, so I do have the pleasure of being able to talk about um, two gentlemen that I have grown very, very fond of, have become um, very close friends of mine. And um, you know what? There's a lot to talk about, about, about these two gentlemen. I was trying to figure out who to, who to talk about first because there's a, an equally long list for both of them. So I just decided to do it in alphabetical order. So I'm going to start with Mr. Crank. But... Um, you know, one of the things that was definitely a difficulty in the early part of Commissioner Crank's time on the commission was we had to work with him about being shy. <laughs> you know, we had to have a lot of side discussions. Commissioner Crank, it's really important that if you're going to be on this commission, that you don't beat around the bush and that you be very straightforward with what your opinion is. And it's okay sometimes to be a little bit brash. And as you can all see, that, that lecture worked very, very well, like by meeting two. <laughs> because by meeting two, all of those things applied to, um, to the way that the Commissioner Crank went about his business. <clears throat> you know, he brought a lot of experience. Both of these gentlemen brought a lot of experience to this commission. And I think, you know, both of them reflect the character that Wyoming citizens expect. Um, and, and they represent, you know, a true Wyoming wildlife conservationists both of them do and and so when i talk about pat you know you look at first of all lifetime um sportsman lived in wyoming his whole life grew up hunting and fishing just like many of us did in the state of wyoming and um a former prosecutor you know the former attorney general for governor dave friedenthal extensive experience when he when he served in that role with endangered species act issues which is something that this commission deals with all the time um, had a lot of relationships across the entire state that he leveraged on a regular basis to get good work done for um, for wildlife. And then, you know, now operating as a successful businessman, not in the in the in the public sector anymore. There's a few things, and I'll have some more time to elaborate tonight. But there's a few things that really highlight, I think, Commissioner Crank's service on the commission. You know, first of all, he he has been a vehement advocate for mule deer. He absolutely loves mule deer, um, has been very dedicated to mule deer research, um, management, habitat work. I talked earlier today after Ian's presentation about some of the vision that um, Commissioner Crank had with the mule deer initiative. Now, there was a time when we had to work together on developing that vision. There were some arguments that happened behind the scenes, but at the end of the day, um, he decided to take risk along with Commissioner Rael and move that thing forward and you can see that that risk has paid off. Um, so he was an instrumental part of the Mule Deer Initiative. It had been around for a while, but actually putting funds towards that and providing some flexibility for prioritization has brought that, that initiative to where it is here today. He's always been very forward looking. He always, um, when he made a decision or when he talked about his thoughts on a particular issue, he, he wasn't always thinking about today and tomorrow. He always was thinking about the next commission and, you know, what his grandkids were going to deal with in three or four or five decades. Early in his time on the commission, Commissioner Crank started um, asking a lot of hard questions and um, really challenging the department to look at what are we going to do about CWD. I can remember many statements that he made about, we aren't gonna just sit and do nothing. That's not an option. This is hard work. We don't have any silver bullets. We don't know what the heck there is to do, but you know what, we're gonna do something because that's what our responsibility is. That's what our charge is by not only the Wyoming statutes, but also the citizens of our state. Um, he pushed, he prodded, he allocated resources and, and put a lot of thought into it. And at the end of the day, um, I think that a lot of where we where we come with the CWD management plan started six years ago with a lot of prodding and, and inspiration from Commissioner Crank. He's certainly been a leader on the commission. He he um, has mastered leading from behind, and he has definitely took his charge as a commissioner very seriously and knew that his responsibility was to the commission form of governance that has been successful in our state for 100 years. He took that responsibility to heart. He, was, um, he articulated that well. 
he was not a rubber stamp for the department because he knew at the end of the day, that's not what was right for wildlife or the public or the department. He helped the commission through some very turbulent times when there were contentious issues, when commissioners were receiving emails from people calling him bad names because of decisions they made with wolves or bears um, or on other particular issues. You know, he was somebody that was there to provide some help and some counsel. He always voted his conscience and he always asked others to do the same. And he was a proponent of having, um, you know, having very passionate discussions amongst the group that everybody ought to state their opinion. He oftentimes would disagree with other commissioners. He oftentimes would disagree with the department. He oftentimes would disagree with things we heard from the public, but he did it because he wanted to do what was right. And as far as leadership goes, you know, he's currently the, the vice president, but one of the things that was interesting is, as Commissioner Crank said early on, he said, I want to be able to vote on all these issues. I don't want to be the president because the president doesn't get to vote. He, you know, one thing too, you know, he, he was passionate about supporting um, non-governmental organization causes and, and great events that supported wildlife. And he nearly gave his life in that endeavor. He was on his way to the two shot goose hunt to go support that effort for, you know, for the benefit of wildlife. And he was in a terrible crash and he, he nearly died and spent months, weeks in the hospital and then months of, of recovery. He has been described by some, not me, as a big teddy bear. Um, you know, and he kind of, if you look at him and you don't let him talk, he kind of is. <laughs> he, um, he reminds me, though, you know, of, um, of kind of a fatherly figure on the, amongst the group that can always provide that necessary counsel and thoughtfulness and reasonableness that really helped guide the commission even when he wasn't in a particular leadership role. And you know, he always did what he thought was right, even when he was adamantly wrong, <laughs> which didn't happen often. But uh, anyway, Commissioner Crank, we are going to miss you and we um, can't say enough about what you've done for this department and for the state for wildlife, for this body. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to serve with you. We have a couple of things that, uh, Pat hates these kind of things. He doesn't like being the center of attention, but we do have a couple of things here that we wanted to present publicly. First of all, I wanna give you one of my director coins. Tell you thank you. And we have Really cool yeah, metallic signs that are actually made by. This is kind of a this is a Wyoming homegrown deal. Our IT guy over here, Wayne, his father-in-law makes these things, and uh, so you know it's presented. It's got Pat's name on it, the years that he served on the commission, and and again, thank you very much, my friend. So, Mr. David Rael, I have plenty of things to say about you as well. So, unlike Pat, David never had any problems at all speaking his mind. He, in fact, oftentimes, you kind of had to grab his hand and um, remind David that it was better to take a few minutes first and think about it. He always followed, well, not always. Most of the time, he followed that, adv that advice. Um, he often used... Um, interaction with the public to force at public meetings to force <laughs> discussions and deal with whatever the elephant in the room was. He wasn't afraid to go there and he um, he had no issues whatsoever um, just being very pointed about where he thought the discussion ought to go with the commission. He is also 
um, has some extremely diverse experience, um, lifelong sportsman. He's a good old Wyoming boy. He, um, he's been, he's a very successful self-made businessman, has a, a very um, thriving Wyoming business. Um, lots of experience that he brought to the commission was with project planning and management. Um, strong working knowledge that he has of of um, how wildlife policy works on the ground because he spent so much time out there um, viewing wildlife and being a participant in wildlife conservation. I'll bet a whole bunch of you didn't know this. He also used to be an actor. He's actually been in two movies. <laughs> He's gonna kill me. <laughs> I can just see, I got all kinds of roles for him to play. So. Um, David is a, you know, one of the one of the highlights, one of the best things that David leaves with our state is what he's done for you. And he 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 had this vision of being able to go out and bring people from the communities into get face to face with the commissioners and then and to bring their kids. And what he really what he what he wanted to see happen there is he saw all this goodness that came from the commission and came from the department, and he wanted the communities and and especially kids to come in and be able to see that stuff, put their hands on it, and and have the department set up booths and 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 have kids come and, and see all that stuff. And then he did a tremendous amount of fundraising, and he um, he would he he's responsible. This man alone for in three places for the donation of over 150 lifetime licenses to kids. These events were huge. I mean, we had an event in Lovell, one in Powell, one in Cody, that were the biggest we've ever had in the state. We did them in other places in the state. And those three places, he took the lead and he was, because he's just so passionate about kids and being involved in wildlife, um, extremely, extremely impressive. Um, he's always been a staunch supporter of department employees. He's always, um, this commission's always been great to our department employees, but he um, has always gone out of his way um, out in his district, as well as at these meetings, to make sure that department employees know how much he appreciates what, what they do for wildlife. He spent a lot of days in the field um, working with our employees with wildlife on the ground. Um, he spent days, I mean, literally, several days in road doing pack trips into the, the Washakie wilderness with our employees to learn about what it's like to go work in that kind of an environment. Um, he always made one of the decision points for him when he considered an issue was maintaining the culture and the history and the traditions that we all have and enjoy in Wyoming and that we're all proud of. Very supportive of investing in research and habitat as well. Very engaged in the Endangered Species Act issues, which was very important up in his district because that's all important stuff. Um, very generous man. Generous with his time, his own money, his equipment, with his business. Um, he served as the president in 2019 and, and a little bit into 20. Uh, extremely enthusiastic. Um, Hard to slow him down. This guy, he'd come rolling in sometimes at, you know, at midnight for a meeting the next morning because he's got a lot going on. Um, very high character, uh, a man that I've grown to just have a tremendous amount of respect for. You know, he is, though, a little bit like I said Pat Crank was the teddy bear. Sometimes David's like the cow elk. And, you know, sometimes you really you, you watch elk for a while, and pretty soon you think you can kind of predict them. And that old cow elk sticks her nose up in the air and starts heading out. And the first time that you think that you've really got this figured out and you know right where she's going to go, you know, she goes the other way. Sometimes that's David. Sometimes it's kind of hard to, when his nose is up in the air and he's headed out, it's kind of hard to know if he might not go that way. But uh, David, again, thank you so much for what you've done for this commission, our state, our department. Um, what a tremendous honor that it's been for all of us to be able to. Similarly, um, I'm going to give you one of the coins. And we have a very similar metallic 
sign for you. All right, I'm going to turn this over to who's on Zoom is up first. First of all, I, I want to. I don't know where to begin with these two guys. They both have two different styles, two different types of commissioners. Both work very well. At first, I, th I felt like they treated me like their little brother, feeding me along. You know, being a commission member is, is one of the best honors I've had. And being with these two guys makes it that much better. These guys are like a father figure to me but more like brothers now. Before we go to the public, are there any other commissioners that want to say something now? And certainly we have time to get into that too. Mr. President, Director Nesbik, I would. Um, as new guy and watching you guys, I have learned a lot. I respect you immensely. And, um, with your perm permission, Pat, I'd like to use the coveted phase of budget dust. I think that's classic. David, I hope I gain the generosity you have on how you treat people. You guys are exemplary commissioners, and um, you leave pretty big shoes to fill. I'll never fill them, but I'm going to try hard. I'll just make it quick as I usually do, but I've enjoyed meeting both of you and working with you, and thanks for helping me along the way. I hope you have a great time after the commission. Cy right. Gilman. President Duby. <laughs> Director Nesvik, Commissioners Rial and Crank. Um, this is something that the Outfitters Association doesn't do very often. Um, I wish we did it more, but in the case of you two in particular, we felt a very strong need to recognize and say thank you for all you've done for the Commission and the wildlife of Wyoming in the last six years. Um, you two have had an incredible impact on the decisions that the department has made for the last six years. Um, we feel a strong kinship to both of you as individuals, but an, a great deal of respect for how you conducted yourself with the exception of that one time, Pat happened to uh, <laughs> put my head at that first season setting meeting. But other than that, but anyway, it was, it's been a great run with you two. Um, we really appreciate everything you've done for the, the commission and the department. Todd Stevie was supposed to be on Zoom with us today, but we could not find a screen large enough for him. So he, I'm going to stand in for him instead. So anyway, we, we've got a special presentation that um, we would like to present to both of you. Um, it's a couple nights of, of time with you and your spouse in Todd Stevie's camp at Green River Lakes. Uh, to include fly fishing and horseback riding. And I'm hoping as many of our members that we can get up there and join you for that trip this summer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Cy. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, Harvey Dalton. Are we on? I haven't heard yet.
You want us to go on to the next one first? Somebody can call him or something. All right, we'll hold off on that. Josh Corsi. President Doobie, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Okay, President uh, Doobie, Director Nesvik, and uh, I think it's important to... Uh, to not Josh, only... you need to speak up a little bit louder, sorry. All right, uh, let me see if I can make an adjustment on my end. President Doobie, is that any better? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Go ahead. President Doobie, is that any better? Yeah, that'll work. Must not hear me. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Like, is he on his phone or is he on? Commissioner Doobie, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Uh -huh. We can. Yeah, I'm having a difficult time hearing you, apparently. <laughs> yes, sir. You can apparently hear me, but I'm not being able to hear you. Yes, that's correct. All right, let me try that. All right, thank you. All right, well, it sounds like you, you can hear me, and I, I'm just maybe having some difficulties on my end hearing you. Uh, but... Uh, if you can hear me, I'm, gonna, I'm going to just proceed because it's important I, I share this with you in this time. Uh, of all the disappointments, I can relate that uh, we as an organization have had to experience the, the cancellations of due to COVID and the pandemic. I can tell you the uh, ability to be there in person to recognize both Commissioner Crank and Commissioner Rayel, they're at the top of the list of disappointments from not being able to be there in person. Um, Commissioner Roberts, welcome to the commission. Commissioner Bird, Commissioner Ladwig, Commissioner Brokaw, Commissioner Doobie, I thank you all for your continued service. Uh, but these two gentlemen specifically, I would like to offer these words to you. These are important words that I think resonate today just as they did in 1910. And I think that uh, it's a charge that I carry every day. And it's a charge that I know in your actions and your service to the great state of Wyoming that you have held in the highest regard. Theodore Roosevelt said in 1910, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man, in this case, the men, who are actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, who spins himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who, need, who knew neither victory nor defeat. My proverbial hats off to you both, and I look forward to seeing you on the trail. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. It's Josh. Thank you. All right. Gentlemen, 
Yes, Harvey. Uh, yes. Uh, I just, my uh, computer timed out just as the uh, director uh, announced my name. But uh, if we could, President Duby, uh, Director Nesvik, commissioners, um, I want to thank you for allowing me uh, a few minutes of uh, your time at the end of this busy day. Uh, as the president of Bowhunters in Wyoming, we too want to show our appreciation to outgoing Commissioner Crank and Commissioner Rael. Uh, you both have dedicated six years of endless hours to the department, in which time your work has helped accomplish many goals set by the commission. Uh, as archery hunters, we have greatly benefited from your timeless dedication toward the conservation of wildlife and habitat. And if we could, at this time, uh, we've hooked up with uh, Deputy Chief Doug Breimeyer. I can't see you folks, so uh, if Mr. Breimeyer is there, um, he's offered to help us in presenting uh, these appreciation plaques to Commissioner Crank and Commissioner uh, Rael. Um, I, I'm not sure if... Uh, what's happening there because I, I, I timed out. But uh, once again, gentlemen, we want to thank you uh, for your drive and uh, your hard work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harvey. Appreciate it. Oh, now I can see you. Okay, there we go. Is there anything else, Megan? Yeah, I would and, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Before we do that, you guys want to say something? David, you're going to say something? <laughs> My apologies. Thank you. You know how I feel. Come on, you need to say more than that because you need to cry before I cry. <laughs> um, just. Uh, It has been, I'll get a hold of myself here in a second. Um, it has been an incredible honor to um, <clears throat> it has been an incredible honor to have this job and to serve um, with my fellow commissioners. Um, you, you're some of the most amazing people I've ever met. And it's been an incredible honor to serve with the amazing employees that we have at the Wine and Game and Fish Department. Um, I know at times I've been hard and I've been grumpy on you. And uh, I, I hope you didn't take it personal, but um, I had a passion for what we were trying to do. And, and it's just, I can't imagine working with a better group of people. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be, I wanted to be on the Game and Fish Commission <clears throat> since I was in high school. And, um, you know, it's just been such a privilege to have this opportunity, so. And, and not only, you know, my fellow commissioners, um, the employees of the department, but the NGOs, the other folks in this state that are passionate about wildlife, um, you know, I, I can't list them all, but the uh, folks that spoke today, I, it's just been an incredible privilege to do this. And I thank you so much for giving me that opportunity. Finally did it, Commissioner Rael, speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I would move that we adjourn the meeting for the day. I'll second. I'm going to have Commissioner Rael second that. I'll second. Moved by Commissioner Crank, seconded by Commissioner Rael to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 See you tomorrow morning.